Invite councillors to please take their seats. And Pauline, I'll invite you to open the meeting. Kia Tēnā koutou i honga, kua haere mai nei ki tēnā wahi, ki te whakinui, i te kaupapa nei. Nō mai tōtou mai, nō rira tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou kato. Kia ora. Kia ora. Thank you. So welcome to today's meeting to adopt the annual plan. Um, moving to item one, um, apologies. I've got no apologies. However, we have the Mayor's request for a leave of absence to approve, um, which I'm happy to move. Do I have a second for that? Anne Galloway? Eight a second. All those in favour say aye. aye. Against? That's carried. Um, item two, declarations of interest. I've got nothing noted, but just a reminder that as we move through the meeting, if there are any matters where um, interest need to be declared, please do so at that time. Um, and I now turn to item three, the annual plan minutes from the 19th to 26th of June. Um, I'm happy to move that those minutes be confirmed. Sam MacDonald um, seconds. All those in favour say aye. aye. Against? That's carried. Um, so what I propose to do now is to deal with clauses 2.1 to 2.3 in the recommendations. Um, and Carol, I would invite you to um, introduce this part of the proceedings today. Thank you, Andrew. Um, so firstly, I'd like to just start by thanking everyone who's been involved in pulling this um, annual plan together under difficult circumstances and in a very short time frame. So thanks to elected members, all of my staff and the teams right across council, but also to the public who have um, participated and provided responses to us. So what we have here in front of us is um, the final annual plan that incorporates um, the feedback from councillors, but also the feedback from the public. And um, if we just look quickly now at those um, things, we're asking you to receive the information contained in the report and note that the Audit and Risk Committee have reviewed the process. And we do have a um, short video here from Kim Wallace, who is the Chair of the Audit and Risk Committee. And um, before <coughs> we show that, I just want to talk briefly to you about point two, point three which is um, around us adopting an annual plan that is an unbalanced budget. Now this is unusual, but in the circumstances that we're facing with the COVID-19 impacts, we've worked through this and we believe that this is a financially prudent approach in the circumstances. And we've satisfied both ourselves as management, but also our Audit and Risk Committee on this. So there is some borrowing, but that borrowing will be repaid over five years. <coughs> So I wonder if now, Andrew, would you like us to play the video? Yes, please. Kia ora, I'm Kim Wallace. I'm the Chair of the Audit and Risk Committee for the Christchurch City Council. Uh, firstly, I'd like to express my apologies for not being able to attend in person to your council meeting where you are deliberating on the annual plan 2020-2021. Firstly, I just want to say that the purposes of addressing you today is to provide you with some trust and confidence in the process that the Audit and Risk Committee has uh, undertaken and followed over the course of the last couple of months in our considerations of the annual plan. As you may be aware, the terms of reference for the Audit and Risk Committee is that we need to take into account whether a proper process has been adopted and followed. Secondly, we consider risks and whether they have also been considered appropriately. And also, we want to be given assurance that the assumptions and judgments and estimates that have been adopted by management and are put forward to us by management are also appropriate and reasonable. There's a number of significant forecasting assumptions that are made by management and put forward to us and we have gone through those today in depth 
and looked at all of those and also we've gone through the management representations to ensure that we're comfortable that they are correct and appropriate. At the table today and in the committee you have three independent members. One being myself, the chair, you've got Mike Rundell and also Jackie Robertson. What we bring to your committee is a wealth of experience from the commercial sector but also technical expertise from accounting and audit and risk assurance matters. In doing so, our roles and the responsibilities that we bring and we adhere to a strong sense of responsibility of ensuring that risk and assurance, a broader lens is applied, that we're looking at challenging and also a little bit of pressure testing also on the work that is done in, put, um, in front of us for consideration. Through the course of the annual plan, the independents were kept up to date and informed by management from time to time and we also had deep dive briefings with management to ensure that in line with your council process and where you were do doing deliberations on the annual plan, we also were kept informed. And as Chair, I feel relatively comfortable that that was done um, as I would expect. The COVID-19 implications for Christchurch City Council have been significant and we can't lose sight of that. However, I would say having attended recently the Office of Auditor General, a webinar that uh, was focused on Auckland City Council and the work that they did for their annual plan de deliberations. I'm of the view that the Christchurch City Council, the way that the COVID-19 implications and the associated risk and changes to the annual plan and the work that was done, I believe, uh, was of the same level as Auckland City Council. I would also say that the ability for Christchurch City Council to pivot and to move this uh, organisation to be in a working from home situation was excellent. So I think that that was very clear when that uh, the webinar that was run by the Office of Auditor General and they looked at lessons learned uh, I think there's a real strong story to be told by Christchurch City Council about the work that was done here. And I think that that has been translated through to the annual plan and the work that has been put um, forward to the Auditing Risk Committee for consideration today. It was clear to us that the community outcomes and obligations of Council were put at the heart of the decisions that have been made, despite these difficult circumstances. And where we've got to today is that there has been a sound basis for the decisions made and not only that, we feel strongly that the process that has been followed has been absolutely appropriate and reasonable. So on that note, I would like to conclude that uh, the Audit and Risk Management Committee at its meeting today has resolved to recommend to the Council that an appropriate process has been followed in the preparation of the information that provides and underpins the basis for the 2020-2021 annual plan that you will be deliberating on today. And finally, I would just like to say I look forward to presenting to Council in person at a future date and again my apologies that I couldn't be there today. Thank you. All right, so it's good that Kim was able to join us um, on the video. It was a little bit unfortunate that that broke up in the way it did at the end, but um, such is technology. Um, Sam, was there anything that you wanted to add as the Deputy Chair of um, Audit and Risk to what we've heard from Kim? No, not at all. I mean, just to really reiterate that the process has been very thorough from the outset and that there were no concerns raised at the meeting around it and that Carol and the team were more than comfortable answering questions. Um, so there was a general consensus from independents and elected members on the Audit and Risk that the process that Andrew's led and Dawn and the team uh, was more than adequate and that um, you know we're, we're comfortable with it. 
Thank you. Thanks for those comments. Um, Carol, back to you. So we're now up to the next part um, where we need to look at the recommendations from the from the Mayor, and I understand, Andrew, you were wanting to take those separately, or did you want us to talk through a little bit? Of okay, what I want to do first is just conclude the matters that we've dealt with, which is clauses 2.1, 2.2 and 2.3. Um, so I'm happy to move those clauses. Jake McClellan, you're happy to second. Um, so let's get those ones um, done, and then we'll move on to the Mayor's recommendations. So I'll put that motion. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Against, that's carried. And then, yes, Carol, the, um, the Mayor's recommendations. And I would just make the point, um, obviously the Mayor isn't in the room today, um, so these should be thought of as the, the acting Mayor's recommendations in the context of this meeting. Um, they're essentially pro forma recommendations that allow us to, um, to have the debate around each of these matters and conclude the um, annual plan. Um, but yes, in the absence of the Mayor, I would make the point that these should be seen as the acting Mayor's um, recommendations. So, Carol, over to you just to um, introduce things. So, um, there were three key issues that we consulted on with the public. The first one was around the excess water charge, the second was around the um, use of glyphosate, and the third was around strengthening community fund. And um, based on the feedback that we've had from the public, but also from the debate that councillors have had, I understand that, that reflect, the Mayor's recommendations reflect the majority view of councillors on this. So, um, Andrew, did you want us to invite each of the people on those items up? Um, yeah, what I will do is just make a comment about how we're going to handle this, or how I'd propose to handle this next part of the meeting. So we've got the Mayor's recommendations in front of us. Um, what I would propose to do is to deal with the, the three issues that we raised in the consultation document um, separately and first, and then deal with the balance of the Mayor's recommendations as a whole. So the three issues to deal with are the um, excess water charges, um, the glyphosate, and the increase in community funding. Um, we obviously raised those as three specific questions, along with a question about the um, rates increase in the consultation document that we put out. Um, the community have responded, I've got to say, very well and very meaningfully to those questions. Um, we received a, a number of written submissions. A lot of people took the time and trouble to come and speak to us about these matters in this council chamber through the hearings, and we absolutely appreciate the way that not only the community have responded to the engagement, um, and been part of the engagement, but the way that um, people have responded to the specific questions that we asked. So what I'd like to do now is to deal with the um, water charges, the glyphosate and the increase in community funding and close the loop on each of those matters in a way that's easily understood by the community who've responded so well to the questions that we asked um, and then move on to the balance of the recommendations. Before we do that, um, there's a formality of suspending standing orders, um, which is normal for these meetings and it just allows a more info informal approach to the work that we've got to do. So um, I'll now move that we suspend the standing orders 17.5, 17.6, 18.1, 18.8 and 18.9. Um, Pauline, you're happy to second that. All those in favour say aye. aye. Against, that's carried. Okay, so now in the spirit um, in which I um, set out a few minutes ago, um, can we now move to the residential excess water charges? Um, and Helen, welcome to the table. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for the work that you've done on this. And I know there have been a number of questions that you've answered and, and informal presentations that you've provided as we've gone through the process. Thank you to you and the team for the work that you've done on this particular matter. Are there any comments that you wanted to make by way of introduction? And then we'll move to any further questions if there are any. Thank you. Uh, so just to introduce the water charges and remind councillors that for the majority of residential ratepayers, this will not make any difference to them. They will continue to pay the targeted water use rate and would not be paying the excess water use charges. The excess water use charges, when we first introduced them for consultation, we set the, the, the volume threshold quite high to catch the top 20%. Having done further work, it looks as though that 
top threshold will actually catch the top 15%, so slightly fewer um, properties than we originally expected. Uh, and yes, we've done uh, a bit of work to show the geographic spread across the city, which is fairly even. So um, it falls right across the city from north to south, east to west. Uh, and we've done a little bit more work on what the exemptions or partial credit scheme would look like for people who need water for, say, medical purposes and would use over and above what they would normally use. Happy to answer questions. Mm. Thank you. So let's take questions just on this matter, if indeed there are any. Are there any questions for Helen on the um, excess water charge matter? Sam. Helen, I just wonder if it's worth, um, in, a, in this public setting, talking through the practicality of implementing this, and I guess how we'd go about monitoring it with the current system we have of metering across the city. So could you allude to that a wee bit further? Certainly. So Christchurch has most residential properties are metered. Um, there are a number that are not in, um, in centres such as Littleton, for example, where we have few metres. And there are a number of properties where one metre serves multiple properties um, on individual titles, and so we would not be able to um, would not be able to implement the charge for those types of properties. Although um, we also would not expect that type of property to use excess water because they don't they don't have large gardens um, and don't have the irrigation systems generally. In terms of the, um, the metres themselves, generally we read residential metres once every one to two years and we would move to quarterly readings. So we would change the practice of reading metres and move to quarterly readings. That would also assist us in terms of leak detection and understanding exactly where the water is going across the network. The charge itself, we would read those metres quarterly and let people know if they're using very large amounts of water. However, the invoice wouldn't come until the end of the year because we generally see a pattern of relatively low use through the winter and for the excess users, very high use through the summer. So we need to see the total volume used over the whole year before any invoice is issued. Thank you. Jake. Thanks, Helen. Um, you made mention of the fact that Littleton has relatively few metres in it. And I notice in that, that ward breakdown, it's um, the percentage of, of, of the people in, in Littleton that are getting charged is half, say, what it is in Hornby. How do you kind of reconcile that? Is that just a matter of if you're unlucky enough to be in Hornby, then you, you might get a charge? And if you're lucky enough to live in Littleton, you probably have a slightly higher percentage chance of not, not being charged? There are um, so few water metres in Littleton that it's not... Um, it's not sort of statistically significant in terms of the water use in Littleton, so I don't think that that 10% figure is real. So there really are so few properties that are metered over there that we don't know. I wouldn't expect it to be any different to the rest of the city, though, once we have much more comprehensive metering. Sorry, I mean, what I mean is that there may be people in Littleton that are using in excess of, of, of the allocation, but because there's no metering, they're not getting charged, whereas in another part that has a large provision of metres, they will in fact be getting charged. Is that not correct? Yes, that is correct. And we are rolling out um, a metre installation programme to address that. Yes. Yep, so Jake, that was everything from you? Yep, great. Yali. Thanks, um, and thank you for the additional information that you've sent through about the ward breakdown. I'm just trying to understand what this means for the lower socioeconomic areas of the city. And when I look at the percentage charged, it would appear that like Kashmir, Heathcote, um, uh, Fendleton wards, there's, a, there's um, a less percentage of people that will be charged in the uh, highest um, uh, socioeconomic areas of the city versus compared to say Limwood um, coastal, etc. So, can you just help me understand from a um, a social impact what the implications are of what we're proposing in terms of the poorer areas of the city versus the wealthier areas? So, there's there's two things in that question. Um, the reason that fewer or a smaller proportion are charged in the in the suburbs that you sorry the um, wards that you talked about, um, the Fendleton, Horswell, Heathcote. Uh, and Kashmir is a bit mixed. So some of it is about the size of the sections and some of it is about the capital value of the properties. 
um, because as you know, the, the, our rating policy has that before we introduce the excess water charge, whether it's a commercial property or a residential <coughs> property, we look at what they've paid in the targeted rate, calculate a water allowance from that, and use that either the 915 litres per day or the water allowance as the threshold before charging. So there are mixed reasons for that, um, for the lower proportions in some wards and higher proportions in others. And you'll also note that in the coastal ward you've got the 17% and I'm, I'm guessing that reflects people's gardens on sand dunes and sandy soils, which would uh, indeed require more water if, you're, if you've got a, an extensive irrigation system going. In terms of the, um, the lower socioeconomic areas, we've done a very crude mesh block analysis and there doesn't appear to be um, any higher impact on the lower socioeconomic areas of the city. And indeed, the higher water users tend to be in the higher socioeconomic areas of the city. However, that's, that's quite a crude analysis, just using the mesh blocks that we can get from Statistics New Zealand. Uh, and there'll always be individual circumstances, and that's why we've got an exemptions and a partial credit framework in place, in case there are some particularly perverse outcomes there. Thank you, Jake. Would we be able to get that tabled? I'm very conscious of the thing that happens when you overlay social deprivation uh, quite often is that it, it matches up with, with population as well, so it may look like the more socially deprived areas are having more, but they also tend to have more people packed in there as well. The same as, yeah, it would be great to get that table though. If, if it's, it's the reverse. The, the, the higher socioeconomic areas use higher water, and the lower socioeconomic areas use less water. So, um, and, and that matches what we expect because the excess water use is generally around irrigation, which is generally around large properties. Sorry, if I could have another. Um, so that would seem to point to the fact that the higher socioeconomic areas use more water, and yet you say that the charging is relatively even, although on, I, I don't think it is personally. That would suggest that the policy is actually balancing out in favour of lower, in favour of higher socioeconomic areas and against lower socioeconomic areas. So the the policy is around um, is about demand management for water. So the policy on excess water use charges is, as you can see, only hitting the top 15% of users, and it's about demand management. It's not about making people pay for every liter of water that they use. Uh, the, the allowance for water that we have per property of the 700 litres per day is well above the average use, which is 540 litres per day, and the allowance of 900, just over 900 litres per day is well above um, what even large families use. So information from Auckland, from Watercare, where they have, um, have had water metering and charging in place for many, many years, just it clearly shows that a a family of six, perhaps using water, is generally using water below that 900 litres per day threshold anyway. So, so even large families in low socioeconomic and possibly hardship circumstances are unlikely to get an excess water use charge. So to get the charge, you really have to be using a lot of water outside of the house. This is not ordinary day-to-day -day use of water. This isn't um, showering, flushing your toilet and bathing your children. This is irrigating gardens and extensive irrigation of gardens at that. So that's, that's what the policy is aimed at. It's that very high end of water users. Thank you. Sarah. Thank you so much for um, all the additional work that's been done in the meantime and the graphs and things. Just checking the, um, the, the maps and figures that we've been provided which, with, which have been really, really useful. Um, haven't been able to include things that we don't know, have they? So things like, while there's dots and things on the map which show houses which are currently using excess water, we don't know which ones of those might have larger families which will end up being exempt and then not have to pay the charge. So they will eventually come out and we'll have a better idea as the year progresses, is that right? That's correct. Yeah, so that's good. And in the coastal ward and other areas like that, while you've mentioned the sandy soils, it's also been clear, we know um, from James's experience, that people may have broken pipes on their property, um, and that's been clear there. And so this will allow property owners to get that work done. 
That's um, a major benefit, in fact, of the excess water. So if um, if people get an unexpected excess water use charge, that they don't even use their sprinkler in the height of summer and they love their brown lawn, um, then it's pretty clear that they've got a leak uh, and we can, we can then talk with them, get them to pinpoint and repair that leak and they'll get a credit on the charge. Yeah. So we are very keen to detect leaks like that that people don't even know they have yeah. and get those sorted out. And it may be, um, I know it's happened in other areas of the city where, the, where cracked and broken pipes have clearly been due to earthquake but weren't repaired at the time or checked at the time, that actually those repairs and things can probably be done through EQC still too. Uh, I'd have to check. But we'd have to check on that, that Possibly. would be. Yeah, yeah. Great, thanks. Thank you. James. Kia ora. Just uh, following up on that, I, I, I'll put it on the record that um, I don't know why. <coughs> excuse me. I don't know why I was um, monitored, but um, the usage that Sarah was talking about is correct. Um, I'm using not the normal. What, is, what the average is 700. 500. 500. Oh well, I'm even better than that. It's 1400 for me. So I suspect I have a leak. At leak, obviously, and we're looking into that. But the the bottom line is literally that uh, the figure has come out as to what I would pay in excess water rates, at three times, almost three times the normal usage would be 140 dollars a year. So I'm trying to figure out whether it'd be cheaper to just keep paying that or fix it. <laughs> but no, that, that's what it, that's that's a fact. We would certainly encourage you to fix that and then you would be exempt from those charges. All right. Um, now, before we move into the formalities around these um, recommendations, what I need to do is to move that we receive the Mayor's recommendations as a whole. Sarah Templeton will second that. Um, all those in favour say aye. Aye. Against, that's carried. Um, so now we're done with questions on the um, excess water charge matter. So what we now need to do is to move um, clause 2.4.1, which is the clauses in the Mayor's recommendations that relate to the matter that we're discussing. Um, do I have a mover for that? Um, so I'll get a mover and a seconder for this, and then I know you've got an amendment that um, we'll deal with once we've got this on the table. That's all right. Um, so do I have a mover for um, clause 2.4.1? So that would be to um, approve the excess water use targeted rate. So Sarah, you're happy to move? And a seconder? Mike? All right, so that's been moved and seconded. Now, Jake, you've got an amendment um, that you'd like us to deal with. Um, so we've got the wording for the amendment. Can we get that put up on the um, screen? So that's to remove the words, or more than the water allowance paid for through its rate, whichever is greater, are deleted from clause 1B of the motion. Yep. Yeah. yeah, I'm happy to speak to it briefly as well. Thank you. The alternative wording would be just that, um, and I think it's my intention more so than, than what this wording captures, is that we actually change the allocation to a standard of 950 for every residential household in Christchurch. That would bring in more revenue, still introduce the charge, act as a better incentive to use less water, because now people with higher value households that have a much higher allocation would, would now also be incentivised and be equal, equitable in terms of how it was in terms of how people w were were charged. Because I agree, you know, water use is is um, is something we need to address, but we need to do so in a way that um, that, that is equitable. And we've already heard from staff that this policy, as it stands, uh, doesn't uh, higher uh, households with higher values uh, are, are benefiting because the rate, because the charging is spread a lot more evenly than what the usage is actually spread. So, are you indicating that you're not you're wanting different wording that's here, or is this the wording that you want the amendment to be? Well, my concern with the wording there is we may end up in a situation where people have an allocation and they're being charged at a, at a point in time below which their allocation is, whereas if we have to change the allocation, that problem doesn't exist. So are you comfortable with this wording? No. So can I, I have can the alternate wording yes, that you want your amendment to be? I, I did make mention of this yesterday, but obviously it hasn't filtered through. Um, would you like me to email it through and we could do it like that? Or if you can um, 
If you were just to add another line that said, I have A and B from the staff resolution as they say. Can you just dictate what you've got so sure. that we can get it up on the screen? Yep, so A and B are the same. Introduce a new C, so C and D are gone. The new C says implement an allocation of 915 litres per day for every residential household. So if we can capture this as an amendment rather than actually changing the substantive resolution that's in the recommendation. I can do that as well. Yeah, all right, great. Yeah, I, I thought we'd got the wording um, here, which was what you were actually wanting to move, but if so we can just quickly work through this. change all the other stuff. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Um, what I'm going to do after Jake has got his wording right is I'm going to take some advice um, on whether this amendment um, is able, well, what would happen if the amendment was apparent? Well, first of all, we'll find out whether there's a seconder. And then once we've got a seconder, I'll take some staff advice on the amendment. And then depending where we go, we would take questions and then we would debate the amendments at that point. No. Yeah, B, B would be changed too, but they have the wording that, that has that. We could ask questions now, could we, or maybe not? What I want to do is to get your amendment on the table, moved and seconded, um, and then we'll take some advice from staff, and then depending on that advice, we would move to questions and obviously debate of the amendment. Cool. Well, yeah, it kind of is, but this kind of... I'm sorry then for being negative so early in the morning then with us as we start the day, but this is kind of a good example of why amendments on the fly and literally writing the wording in the chamber on the day of the annual plan adoption is yeah. not overly helpful. I've, I've made some, some comments about that. We're getting the, the wording way. up. Um, <laughs> that, that being said, then um, if, if presuming then Jake has a seconder for it, it would just be, um, it obviously needs to be well traversed by staff. There may Indeed. be financial implications, which again yep. we can Absolutely. consider on the with, day of the meeting. With any amendments put forward, we'll be taking staff advice on whether, amend, where, you know, what the implications of an amendment being carried would be. Um, and it would be appropriate for me to get a second to first before we even go to that point. Yeah. And I intend to move through this reasonably quickly once we've got agreed wording. There we go. So this is a further question on the substantive matter. Yeah, no, I'll allow that, particularly while we're waiting for this. Thank yep. you, thank you. Helen, I'm just wondering that in the light of your comments um, that you're now thinking that this will only target 15% of the high users as opposed to the 20% that we originally sought, what will be the impact on the additional revenue and the rates um, um, reduction? Uh, we'd, we'd already assumed that we would get much less. Mm -hmm. So when we modelled it on historical use, the revenue we expected was about 3.7 million. However, in the annual plan, we've estimated 2 million, two reasons. First of all, there was some uncertainty because we had a smaller data set, and indeed um, that has changed. And secondly, we expect um, that many of those high users would be more conservative in their use of water, which is the point of the policy in the first place. Right, so, so I don't expect it to change that estimate of two million. Okay, thank you. Thanks. All right. So where we're at in process now, have I got people indicating further questions on the um, substantive matter um, on the um, on the original proposal 
before we deal with the amendment. So, Aaron, so because what I want to do is deal with the amendment as a separate matter. But if these are more questions like Pauline's on the overall um, matter, then I'm happy to take them. Aaron? So, just to clarify, on the um, the top 15 percent now, if the ones who are using the, the top 15 who are using the most water suddenly, oh crikey, I'm using a lot of water, so they use less. Is there now a new 15? And so that number just keeps moving? No, and, um, and the reason for that is that the threshold is the 915 litres per day, not the top 20 or 15 per cent. So the threshold is how much you use per day, not the proportion of users. So you're saying there's only 15 per cent of the population use more than the 915? That's correct, from the data that we have. 15 per cent of the households. Oh, wow, OK, cool, thank you. Thank you. Anne? Thanks, Helen, for all your work and your team's work. Um, so if this was passed today, when would a person get their first bill for excess water use? That would be a year away. A year away, OK. Yes. And um, exemptions, what, can you give some idea, I know it's early days, on what that would look, the process would look like? Would people see their bill and then say, goodness, and come back to council? Would there be a separate um, address that they could, uh, email address? How would that work? So yes, we would propose to have um, the information on our website, and in an ideal world, we'd have an online form okay. that they can fill in and put their case for an exemption, and we'd have the criteria available. So we're looking at um, very large households in terms of hardship for families. Uh, we're looking at the medical use, um, and we're looking at leaks and breaks that they didn't know about, as, as long as they can provide evidence that they've addressed those leaks and breaks and, and indeed repaired them. And that's, that's in common with um, a number of other uh, water suppliers and local authorities around the country. So we are encouraging people to sort out leaks and breaks. And we will find some. Thank you. Um, Aaron, back to you. Yeah, just back on the leaks and breaks. If the bill's not coming through for a year, are we giving people a heads up when it's really obvious that they are overusing during the year, like they're out and they've got a brown lawn and no garden and they're using 3,000 litres a week? We'll give them a exactly knock on right. the door. Yes, cool. so we're moving to quarterly reading and so we'll pick up those leaks much more, much more quickly than we have in the past. Them know straight away. Exactly. Cool. Thank you. Melanie. Um, were there other ex well, we've got two things. One was that you mentioned, I think, at one stage about community gardens or other exemptions additional to the ones you just mentioned. Yes, so um, a number of people have brought up a number of special circumstances, so we'll have a special circumstances clause where people can make their case to council. So yes, if they're using um, the water for community gardens, that may well be one of those special circumstances. And um, with um, Aaron's point about the 915 litres, that number came about from looking at the top 20% at the time. So what's now the rationale for keeping it at that value and not 900 or 1,000? Like what's the rationale for keeping it at that number? That's the number that we went out for consultation to the community. So that's the number that we propose to keep for this year. And um, the, we'll do some more work on that. So you'll, you'll note that the consultation document also indicated that as part of our preparation for the long-term plan, that we have a more thorough look at how we pay for water services. And we'll be doing that work. And in fact, the, um, the data from this year as we do more frequent metre reads will inform that and we'll have a much, much better evidence base on water use across the city to inform that conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Pauline. Now the amendment is up, I'm happy to second it. Right, okay, so the, so we're done with questions on the um, main resolution. So we've now got an amendment on the table which is moved by Jake and seconded by Pauline. Um, okay, so what I, so I'm not moving to questions on the amendment yet. I'm gonna take some staff advice on it first. So a further general yeah. question, yep, thank you. Um, just based on the response, I was just wondering when we're going to see the implementation plan for the, the integrated water strategy water supply section? Because I'm just concerned that the resolutions here don't reflect the actual strategic document that we've adopted and don't give us any visibility of that work. Uh, we, um, we're going to provide a report to the Three Waters Infrastructure and Environment Committee on those implementation plans. So at the next meeting of that committee, which helped me, um, Councillor Cotter, I think is August. 
um, we'll have a timeline for the implementation plan for all of those implementation plans, not just the water supply one. There's also the wastewater and stormwater. Has the water supply one been done, complete? We have a draft of the water supply right. st strategic plan, yes. And so, does it come to us for approval? No, it comes to um, so under the integrated water strategy, the implementation plans are approved by the general manager and go through the executive leadership team, and then they come to council for information. Right. So, so we would get the water supply one at the August committee meeting. No, you'll get a timeline on the development of all of those implementation plans, as because you asked this question previously. So we we've committed to giving you a timeline for the development of those. Right. Um, the draft, I don't think the, re the draft is ready to go in front of council yet. Um, it's, in, it's in reasonable state. I'd say it's an 80% draft. Okay. I right. just feel like we've got another process happening and the resolutions that we're being asked to approve. Yeah, we're getting into debate so, now. No, no. Well, just in terms of four, I wonder if, I mean, I didn't want to get in a big debate about it. I think if we've got obvious work streams that are under, underway for water supply, then that should be noted under D. That's all I wanted to say. All right. Um, I think we can take that as happening. I don't think it needs to be formally noted. I mean, clearly there's a paper coming to the committee. Um, but let's, before we start looking at making changes to the um, substantive resolution, let's now deal with the amendment. Um, the key part of this amendment is um, C, implement an allocation of 915 litres per day for every residential household. Um, clearly that's different than the status quo. Um, the, the question I have is whether we are able to do that in this meeting with the information that we've got before us and whether this is a matter that would have been required to consult on differently than we have um, or whether it would require further consultation because you know, I, what I don't want is to see us passing an amendment which isn't capable of being implemented or hasn't followed due process. Um. Quite simply, the answer to those questions is um, yes, we have something that we can't um, implement um, because what it would involve are amendments to the funding impact statement um, and to the way we um, charge for water supply and excess water charges and they're set out in the funding impact statement and our rating policy and we wouldn't be able to make decisions on that without consultation, proper consultation. We simply do not have the time to do that because we are already late with our annual plan. We just cannot do it. And my advice to the chairperson would be that you would be entitled to rule that amendment out of order, that it is not capable of being implemented. Yeah, and then this would form one of the matters that would be taken account of in Clause D above, um, it would be work that we would do and considerations we would make as part of changes that we would make between now and the long-term plan. And obviously the bigger decision we've got to make is whether we implement this um, excess charging now um, and then do the work between now and the, annual, and the LTP to inform any changes or whether we don't do this now and do the work to, in, to inform what some sort of adoption of something like this might look like in the LTP. You, you can adopt the, um, the resolution as it was originally um, drafted um, but not with the changes that are proposed. Yeah. Well, with the advice provided, um, I need to rule this amendment out of order. Yes. Um, if, it's, if it's not able to be implemented without consultation and we haven't done the consultation, I'm not willing to hold the annual plan up in order to do that consultation. Um, that may lead to a question of whether we now, with hindsight, you know, some of us may wish that we'd consulted differently on the matter in the consultation document. We didn't. Um, therefore, this amendment um, is out of order. Well, yeah, I need to take the legal advice I've been provided. I understand that. I understand, I understand what you're trying position, to achieve, I but I need to take the legal advice that's been provided. And, and your decision is, is final and binding and not open for debate. That's a track. That's yep, a track. so I'll rule this amendment out of order. Yes. All right, so um, that now takes us back to the substantive um, resolution that's in front of us. Um, this has been moved and seconded, um, so we now move to debate on this matter. Is there any debate? Yanni. Uh, thank you. Um, look, it's, it's without doubt water is a really precious 
resource for us. In fact, we have an integrated water strategy which um, says te wai ora o tane water for life. Water is a valued taonga in all that we do. As part of that integrated water strategy, we spent time engaging with our community to take a considered approach to how we address the range of issues we're faced with in regards to water. Not just water conservation, but a, a lot of other issues as well. The first implementation plan was the water supply one. That was supposed to be done six months after we adopted that integrated strategy in September last year. I think the discussion about how we charge for water and how we value water and how we conserve water is really important to have as a city. I don't believe doing a rushed amended annual plan with a proposal for charging with so much complexity and a lack of detail in terms of what it means for people uh, is the right way to go. And the maps that we've had, um, which I really appreciate from staff, show very clearly that the wealthiest wards in the city will be the biggest beneficiaries from this. And the poorest wards will be the ones that pay more. And I just simply cannot agree to an approach like that without seeing the social impact assessment. But I don't think we've done one. We haven't spent enough time looking at what this will mean. So I can't support this today. I support the ongoing work around how we value water, uh, but I cannot support the poorest parts of the city being hit with an additional charge while the wealthiest are not. And if anyone's in doubt of that, look at the maps and see the areas where there's no dots. Maryvale, Avonhead, Central City. Those are the areas um, that are not gonna be faced with this excess water charge, and they are the areas with the highest property values. So I cannot support this. Thank you, Melanie. Access to water is a human right, and here in Christchurch we're especially passionate about our aquifer water. It's important though that we use our water resources wisely and not squander them. The majority of submitters, 65%, indicated they supported an excess water charge. As one submitter noted, there are many residents who water their driveways, and that's not a sensible use of our water supply. So in principle, I support the concept of a charge for those who use excess water as a way to discourage unnecessary use of water and encourage water conservation. But there are many submitters and residents groups in my local um, ward of Spraydon who disagreed with the concept of allocating water based on the capital value of a home that a resident lives in. They are rightly concerned that this could unfairly have impacts on households in lower socio-economic areas. Even with a high proposed baseline of allowed water usage before charging commences at the 915 litres, which 85% of households currently use less than, the reality is that the excess water charge really is moving in the direction of volumetric charging. Despite the assurance of exemptions that exist for large families, the water leaks, medical use reasons and special circumstances, I feel wholly uncomfortable with the concept of charging for excess water use until an equitable system can be devised, namely a flat allocation of water to each residential household that's independent of capital value. I know I'm able to support a measure that enables those who can afford to live in highly valued homes to have greater access to water than those who cannot. The status quo, where water is equal, equally accessible to all households, is at this stage the fairest method in my opinion, and I'll not be able to support this recommendation. Thank you. Sam. Yeah, thank you. I won't speak for very long. But let's be very clear. This isn't a water charge. This is a charge on the use of our infrastructure. And I find there is severe irony with the people that are saying today that they don't want to implement this uh, because of the low income people in the city. Uh, you are the same people that want to put our rates up. So we need to be very clear about that. The reality is this is a useful step in terms of user pays. And I think we need to have a far more strategic approach at the long term plan to make it a lot more equitable across the city. But the reality is this is a step in the right direction if we want to severely uh, or coherently manage our infrastructure, which we haven't been doing. So I think we do need to get our heads out of the sand, sand a wee bit about this and be pragmatic in our approach. This is pragmatic. The staff have already indicated that there will be exemptions for people that need it. Um, but the reality is we can't carry on the way we are, and I think there's just severe irony with the approach of some councillors. Pauline. Yeah, thank you. Um, and yes, why I absolutely do support the intention of this policy, and that is the demand management and ultimately water conservation, I am concerned of the inequity in the allocation. <coughs> and I do understand it is not about charging for water, it is about our infrastructure and the uh, taxation on the infrastructure as uh, volumetric uh, use rises. 
But we still need to address this um, issue of allocation, which has emerged out of this work. And, and we heard from submitters that they're concerned that water allocation volumes are inequitable. Why do some get more than others? And why is that determined by property value? And why the rationale behind the change for hugely excessive consumption is to reduce consumption and therefore take pressure off the infrastructure during peak times particularly, the consultation has raised this inequity as a concern. And then submitters are also concerned about the unclear process and potential robustness of the exemptions. How do they apply? How would it be determined? How long would it take? Who would qualify, etc.? And even though Helen has explained how this would be in place, it wasn't clear enough for people who came in and made their opinion clear through their submission. So we're basically currently not really in a position to provide the exact details of either of these two issues because we've not yet done the work. So while I repeat, I do support in principle the water consumption reduction and that the intention of this is to do that, I would recommend that we wait until we've had the time to work on the allocation equity and the exemption criteria and processes. Let's do that work prior to the um, LTP. And I've heard that people generally do support the idea of water uh, um, consumption um, allocations and, and, um, and saving water, but we do need to get this right, we do need to prepare and we do need to be able to assure them that we've got our processes right. So today I won't be supporting this. Um, Aaron and then Jake. Yeah, uh, I will support this. I think it's a step in the right direction because it's around water conservation and uh, I thank the staff for the work they've done on this. Um, as a city, uh, the people of this city waste water. Um, there's no other way to put it. We use incredible amounts of water. Most days we, per person we double what Auckland uses um, and uh, normally we like to beat Auckland but not when it comes to... Uh, our wastage of water, um, we whip them. Uh, on a really hot day in summer, when we peak 30 degrees in Christchurch, we'll use up to, I've seen numbers come through of 650 litres per day per person. Per person, that's phenomenal in amounts of water. Um, because uh, it, it's obviously a good day to clean your driveway, um, water your garden excessively, when you should only do it morning and night. There's so many ways to save water. Um, this does not uh, uh, stop anyone from putting in a rainwater tank. Um, this does not stop anyone from mulching their gardens. This does not stop anyone from being garden smart. Uh, the allocation of over 900 litres a day per household, I think, is uh, quite a generous one. Uh, the fact that at the moment some households pay 15 uh, times more than other households, there should be a little leadway when their water bill comes in. Um, I think that's really inequitable because, yeah, user, user pace does work well. So we'll get on to libraries next. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the, the, he's not joking. He's this not joking. It's, that's the hilarious part. Yeah, and car parking. Yeah. The... Um, the, uh, my, my point around the water is that w where I grew up, uh, when, I was, when I was a young kid, um, my mother and I, we lived in a boarding house in uh, Woolston and Sheldon Street, and uh, I looked up the property value there, and, uh, and my neighbours down the road in Clearwater now, and the difference is 15 times uh, the water uh, charge, because we charge based on your capital value, and there's people that live in neighbourhoods uh, across the city, I won't name them all, but some of them, uh, the ward I represent, who are on fixed incomes. They're retired people mm. that bought their houses 30, 40 years ago, worked really hard their whole life, uh, and now we charge them 15 times more for their water, which when you talk about water being a human right, and um, under the UN Charter for Human Rights, no more than 3% of your income should go on water, which means there should be a cap of 870 odd dollars a year for an individual who's on a fixed income, a retirement income, for their water if we're to sign up to the UN um, or honour our signing up to the UN. So maybe we should be considering that as well. That, yep, you might be asset rich, but we can't sting you for your water. Jake. Great. Uh, look, given what we've heard and the points my colleagues have made, I want to be really clear. I support the idea of charging for the excess use of water. I support the idea that, that our use of water is our overuse of water is wrong. However, I also support that the fact that we should take this step next year as part of our long term plan, given my amendment has failed. Um, why? Because we should offer an equal allocation of water to everyone, no matter how much your home is worth. And if we're going to charge people for water delivery, 
based on an allocated amount of water, then it's imperative that we do this at the same time. Because at the moment, and let me be very clear with councillors, this policy will mean that someone using 916 litres of water in a less affluent part of Christchurch will pay before someone using 900, before someone paying in a wealthier part of the city. Yes, the first person might be using too much water for whatever reason. And we've heard through our submission process many reasons why that could be. But it doesn't mean that someone in a less off well circumstance should be charged first. First, And yes, you can point to a hodgepodge of different exemptions, um, but that doesn't make for good public policy. It doesn't mean we should implement it now, and people will fall through the cracks. Of course they will. If they didn't, where's that $2 million or $1.5 million going to come from? So I think we need to in not implement a knee-jerk policy, relying on an exemption patch-up job, and implement a thoughtful policy in a thoughtful time frame, as I suspect it was originally intended as part of the long-term plan process. I also think it's egregious to offer advice that says we can't go out to consult on an excess water charge. Listen to what submitters have said. People like Chrissy Williams, who said we should do, who said we should offer a flat allocation, and then say to make that change and respond to that consultation is somehow unimplementable. That's outrageous advice, and it sets a very, very dangerous precedent. Thank you. Um, Anne, and then I've got James, Mike, and Tim. Anne. Thank you. Uh, while I support the principle behind this, which is that we start valuing the most important resource that we have, which is our water, I can't support this today because I just don't think we're ready as a community to make this decision. There's too much confusion. There's too much um, lack, there's lack of information. I think people are unsure what this will mean, and I don't think that uh, we have given it the, the time it deserves in terms of having a discussion with our community. We saw through our resident survey that people want more uh, collaboration, more uh, communication on big issues with council, that they don't feel they get enough opportunity. This is one of those big issues and I believe we should put it on hold, have that discussion and then uh, look at it again at LTP time. So I won't be supporting this today. James. Thanks. Um, I'll keep this pretty brief, but I, I along with um, uh, the majority uh, of residents ag agree that this is a good move. There is a strong and clear majority of respondents through the annual plan consultation process um, that agree that this is a good move. Look, the result of it is pretty clear. It will curb water wastage and it will contribute to a small rates reduction. So generally I do subscribe to a user pays philosophy, but this is fairer than that. You know, 85% of households won't see an additional bill. This isn't user pays, it is abuser pays. And I think that's fair, I think that's reasonable. And at the end of the day, not only are we going to truly value um, our most, one of our most precious resources um, and, and uh, be able to curb uh, wastage of it, but it will contribute to lowering rates. So I think it makes perfect sense, and the community have told us that in no uncertain terms. Thank you. Mike. Thank you. Um, look, firstly, I'd just like to thank Councillor Johansson for um, labelling the ward I pre represent as one of the poorest wards in the city. Um, I'm not too sure if many of the communities I actually represent would agree with that statement. Um, look, I, 333,000 litres of water per year. You know, it's 915 litres on average a day. That is a lot of water. Um, this is not about targeting the poorer suburbs. Uh, this is actually about you know, treating our, our water resources as the natural and precious resource it is. is. Um, and it's not about um, trying to actually move to a user pay system. Actually, my hope is that council would make no revenue from this. And actually, people would just stop using the amount of water they are using. Um, we, we know that through the uh, resolutions we've got, we're going to address some of the concerns during the long-term plan. Um, but the reality is 65 per cent of the people that submitted to the annual plan support what we're trying to, to achieve. We know that there are, are exemptions for people with large families, so they are not going to get targeted um, because they actually they're using water most likely for genuine purposes, um, and that which we should be entitled 
to do. This is simply actually about making sure that water is respected. And actually right at the moment in this city, it is not respected. And, and that's a shame. So I'll be supporting this and I hope others do too. Tim. Uh, thank you. Look, I'm going to just um, follow on from uh, Councillor MacDonald and Councillor Davidson. I think that this is really a first step on a journey and it has to start somewhere. I totally agree that there are people in the city who do not respect the water and who use it flippantly. And I think that moving to a quarterly reading will um, really help seal those um, leaks that are still existent, as we heard with um, Councillor Daniels. Um, it's not about charging, it's about acknowledging there is a problem in the city with respect to water. It's importance to us, and we've got to manage that somehow. And I do hope that we come to a system where we do not charge a single person because they are all living within their means and the bigger respect for the environment. Um, I do think we need, this is the first step as I said, it is the LTP where we have sent a clear message to staff our concerns with this process and the system and that's when I think that we will address it and get a better plan for the future for the city. So I will be supporting this today. Thank you. Thank you. Jimmy. Thank you. I am not support uh, the, this one because uh, it is not a popular timing. Because we are all aware you know, this year is quite serious, the, affected by the, uh, the COVID-19 pan pandemic. You know. More or less, every household has uh, lost uh, uh, affected. And uh, even uh, we are all aware, you know, some of the owners the, the, are uh, anxiety at this point you know, regarding the, the the lots of the, the, uh, the suffering issue. But this one, uh, I also I'm particularly concerned that, you know, this the, is the, the inequity and the not uh, you know, compliant with the uh, failures. Because uh, water is not uh, nice to have. Water is not a uh, luxury. Water is essential, you know, it's uh, necessary for our uh, daily living. Every household, in my view, you know, even high value, low value, should be the equal warrant. But in, based on this situation, it's not, not equal. If you high value property, you can get more in a quarter. But no, no the value one, you get it's less. So easy you know, will be the, you know, to over this the, uh, basic or fundamental the, the kind of the, uh, con uh, con consumption of this the water. And also, the, we can see that the, all the a moment, particularly regarding to the exemption, is to be reviewed the case by case, but it looks like no kind of objective standard. It's subjective, you know, the, the point of view. But how to review those one can keep the, the, the kind of objective the standard is where we will the, the crucial and also particular aware, you know, a few the, the, the residents, even the public owner, there's still the, 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 the kind of the, the, the concern or you know, lots of issue, illiquid issue, fairness issue, water conservation issue, of course recovery. The, this one, we, my view, you know, we should be the postponed to the long term plan overall to review this one. It's not just whether, you know, we consider or deliver service need to have a get a two million dollars, you know, to offset the, those the water delivery. I don't think so. That's unfair to the, the, the property owners. So I'm not support this one. Thank you. Um, yeah, I was, oh, Phil. Thank you, guys. Um, one of this, this, uh, we've never done this before, ever. So we're on a, we're on a learning curve, um, and I'm sure as we go forward, if, if the cracks that um, Jake is talking about are as wide as the Grand Canyon, our people will adjust the crack to make sure that not everyone's getting done over. Now, at the moment, for all residential people, water is free, and because it's free, we do waste it. Like, if petrol was free, we'd all have V8 cars. If cigarettes were free, we'd all be smoking. So we've got to... Not the two together, though. No, no. But, but if we've got to start somewhere, and... If we can reduce the amount of water, because ordinary people will, will look at their, their water use and maybe back off on it a bit, that we're never going to get charged, we'll save more. If we can save 10%, 5% water, we're using 5% power that pumps it, 
it, it's, it's a spin-off is good for everyone around the whole place, so I will be supporting this. We've got to start somewhere, and if it's wildly, diff wildly wrong, I'm sure we'll be able to um, adjust it going forward. Thank you. Catherine. I absolutely think this is a step in the right direction. It, A, brings awareness to water conservation. It's B, only charged to those who are using excess water, so the top end of water users. There are some considerations for exemptions for um, considering financial hardship. So I, honestly, if, if we don't consider this, our only option is to raise rates higher than we actually want to. So I would encourage um, councillors to support this today, because if it's not today, we keep delaying and delaying and delaying, um, and we, we have to stop delaying everything, just because we don't have enough information or um, and make excuses. So can we please just make a decision today, make the right decision, and I, I strongly believe that the right decision is supporting um, this. Thank you. James. Kia ora. Uh, on the surface, and uh, we have a lot of surface water out in the coastal ward when it's been raining, uh, but on the surface and in principle, I have supported this, uh, I've supported this principle of excess water charging. And I've said so to ratepayers who have questioned me about it, asked me about it, and residents, and also to some of my colleagues. Um, however, the a great outcome from or output from uh, this debate is if you listen, you might have a different view. And I, I acknowledge the, um, the eloquence of Councillor Johansson and uh, Coker in particular in the views that they espoused. And then also note that the chair of the Three Waters Infrastructure and Environment Committee, Councillor Cotter, um, is not going to support this. And I will say now that I'm not going to support it at this point in time because I don't think it's equitable. It's not equitable enough. I support the principle, but the implementation is not quite right. So I don't support it today. Kia ora. Thank you. Um, yeah, this has provoked some interesting debate, and I expected it would. And, and some of that debate has been ongoing throughout the consultation period. And you know, we certainly heard um, a number of um, different views and some concerns expressed um, from submitters. Um, as others have said, I was um, a little surprised at the maps that we saw, um, in particular the, the geographic spread. Um, but, you know, I absolutely agree that we need to turn our minds to how we can manage demand on our networks for water. Um, I absolutely agree that water should be better respected and, and much more valued. Um, and I also agree that overusers um, should pay for their overuse. Um, particularly when you look at the small percentage um, of people who are using a large amount, a very large amount of water. But I also agree that any system we put in place to achieve that should be equitable. Um, and I share some of the concerns that have been expressed around the relationship between the value of property and the allowance and the way that, that appears to um, reflect on the, the maps that we've seen. Um, I agree that anything we put in place needs to be easily understood and therefore respected by our communities. Um, any, any system we put in place also needs to be supported by adequate infrastructure. And I'm very aware of the number of properties in Littleton, which were raised, um, that don't have metering. Um, we need to have the infrastructure in place before we can implement any system equitably across the whole city, and that's what we would need to do. So I believe that we've got further work that we need to do, and I, I welcome us doing it, so that that leads into a good, confident, well-thought-out decision for the long-term plan that addresses the problems that we've got around water. Um, but all of this, for me, aligns with supporting Clause D in today's recommendation, but not supporting implementing this today, doing the work we need to do to implement something confidently for the LTP. Sarah, I'll turn to you to close the debate. Kia ora, thank you. Um, it's clear that the, there is support um, from the community to charge for excess use of our precious water resource, but also clear that there are concerns over the current allocation method already in place. And I think that's the key thing that's been raised during this process, is that people didn't realise that that had been in place for some years. But that's not a um, proposal that we consulted on this time. 
and the focus is on the excess water that is washing down our driveways and through our stormwater system. Uh, I'm satisfied that we can address the allocation issue in the long-term plan while not ignoring the environmental and fairness issues that the current resolution addresses. Several issues have been raised, but the reality is that in most cases people have a choice about how much water they use and where they don't have a choice, such as for large families or if they're allowing their taps to be used for community gardens, we have added exemptions to address the issues of fairness. We will also be reading metres quarterly to give people a heads up on the water that they're using and significant education on water saving and things that they people can do and on how to gain the exemptions in the meantime. There is no reason for a family, a large family or a low income family to be um, having these water charges at all. As we've also seen, high water use in coastal ward may be to do with broken pipes and encouraging them to be fixed is really important. They are not excess water use, they are simply water waste. To allay concerns of my colleagues, I'd like to suggest that staff work with Councillor Cotter and the Three Waters Committee on the exemptions, um, and that's in line with um, C there, and that we engage with the community on the allocation issue ahead of consultation on the long-term plan to make sure that we have a proposal that will be supported through that process. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, just by way of guidance before I put the motion, um, there are three things that could happen when we take this vote. This could pass, it could lose, or because we've got 16 people sitting around the table, it could result in a tie. Which is the status quo. If it results in a tie, what will the effect of that be? The effect is that the, the question is, or the motion is defeated and the status quo is preserved. In other words, it's defeated. So in and, the event of a tie, the, the, the proposal would not be adopted and the excess charge would not be approved? Correct. Yep. And can I just clarify, the rates would you move need to from the financials. up to So the rates go up more than what's in the plan currently? Yeah. Yep. Yep. All right. Thanks okay. for that clarification. So your call, guys. So I'll put the motion. All those in favour say aye. 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 Against, just say, yeah. yeah, we'll just take a division. So if we can have a formal division. All right. Um, so let's put D first, because I think there'll be agreement around that. And then we'll take a division on the rest of the motion. So, um, so just clause D, all those in favour say aye. Aye. Against. All right. So that's D approved regardless. And now let's take a division um, on the remainder of the motion. Councillor Turner? No. Councillor Chin? No. Councillor Coker? No. Councillor True? No. Councillor Cotter? No. Councillor Daniels? Carl? No. Councillor <laughs> Davidson? Aye. Councillor Galloway? No. Councillor Goff? Yes. Councillor Johansson? No. Councillor Kewan? Yes, I'm with the two thirds of the public. Councillor MacDonald? Yes. Councillor Major? Yes. Councillor McClellan? Uh, no. Councillor Skandrit? Yes. Councillor Templeton? Aye. Eight, eight. God, so we're just so that's 8-8, eight, eight. so the um, proposal is not approved. Thank you, and thanks to staff that have done a huge amount of work on this and um, for being available for, for questions today as well. Thank you. All right, so um, where are we at? Quarter to 11. What I would propose to do now is to move to the resolutions relating to glyphosate. Um, we'll have to bring this back now, we've put rates up. So. All right, so I um, will move to the recommendations on glyphosate. There'll be opportunity for debate. Um, now, who have we got to the table for this? Um, park staff and transport staff. So um, if you'd like to join us at the table. <laughs> okay, 
All right. So, um, is there any introduction from staff on this matter? We'll deal with this one, and then we'll take a break for morning tea. Kia ora, councillors. Um, by way of introduction, I think this is a fairly binary decision. You know, um, we have um, given effect to a glyphosate reduction policy since 2016. Uh, I think there's been significant gains in methodologies that both parks and transport um, have implemented, including um, probably most importantly, um, the vast majority of spraying is done by contractors, and contractors' methodologies um, have changed. They've invested in that change. Um, the public feedback suggests that there's continued support to maintain that direction. Um, and I guess speaking on behalf of Parks, um, in, s in terms of uh, our staff, we, we support um, the motion that's in front of you. So I don't know if Stefan you wanted to add to that. Um, we're probably pretty consistent with that um, and also support it as well. All right, thank you. Are there any questions for staff on this matter? Pauline. Yes, thank you, Andrew. So are you saying that um, when we uh, reduced the use in 2016 and contractors and council brought in changes to their methodology, that there would be a disruption and possibly potentially a cost to revert back? Um, yes, definitely. So if there was a decision to revert back, um, I think we would need to consider that that would need to have some tenure. So chopping and changing, for example, if we just went back for a year or two, um, there would be costs associated to that and it would be um, uncertain how much of that saving could actually be realised by the time we'd renegotiated contracts. Thank you. I just wanted to make that clear. Thank you. Aaron. So Andrew, are you saying the staff that work with glyphosate on a daily or weekly basis um, uh, don't like working with it and would prefer that we were using the other products that they're using instead, the organic ones that you can't put near a waterway and those ones? Um, that's, that's a slightly more complex question. Um, the word <coughs> don't like, um, I don't think anyone would, would like necessarily to have to use sprays at all, but um, some staff, glyphosate is the only solution, particularly when we're working around water. Um, so it's not necessarily a matter of like. I think everyone supports the notion of moving away from harmful chemicals. Um, but the model that we have, I guess, evolved since 2016, staff are, are very comfortable with. Right, OK. As the best solution at this point in time. And I think the point to make is that both staff, contractors and suppliers um, have invested in mm. moving away from harsher chemicals and um, there's good gains that have been made. Right, okay, yeah. Thank you. Jimmy. Question is, uh, because the council already in 2016 and 17 decided to reduce, you know, this uh, glyphosate uh, use, but accept, you know, the, uh, here the proposal tried to save the 3.5 or 3.2 million dollars, except this factor, have any other factor, you know, the staff consider, you know, why reuse this glyphosate? What's the purpose, Ex except the saving the cost? Um, look, there's no doubt, I mean, the cost is associated essentially to the efficacy of the pro product. So, glyphosate became very prominently used because of its ongoing and lasting effects, typically over a longer period of time, therefore less labour, etc. Um, the investment that the open market has made is, has really started to explore how to, how to mimic those, those products. For example, the supplier we use um, has just completed testing on a product, an organic product, that has the same attributes as glyphosate, meaning a longer lasting effect. Um, so this is not, I mean, it's, it is essentially about today, it would be cheaper, it's purely a financial decision to go back to glyphosate 
because of that efficacy. But progress is being made. And so we may see a reduction in cost as a consequence of remaining with this policy, um, but it will take year on year on year of investment of time and energy to understand that. Thank you. Mike. Oh, I'm happy to move this. So, Mike, you're happy to move. Pauline, you're happy to second. Um, are there any further questions on this? Is there any debate? Melanie. Uh, no, I'm, I'm hoping that most councillors will um, support this, but I, I've done some research, so I thought I may as well talk about it. So it's not, um, it's not surprising. A majority of submitters oppose the proposal for increase incre to in the, oppose the proposal to incre increase glyphosate in council parks and managed areas, and I congratulate the previous council that had agreed to decrease its use. Although some submitters supported the use of glyphosate, um, those organisations were doing that with the realisation glyphosate is often a tool of last resort to eradicate invasive weeds that threaten our native biodiversity um, in hard to reach areas such as bluffs and the Port Hills. And these areas are difficult to reach by foot and not well trafficked. However, there's no doubt that glyphosate is not a safe chemical to be spraying around willy-nilly. In 2015, Glyphosate was classified as a prob probable human carcinogen by the um, International Agency for Research on Cancer, and I believe that formed the basis for Council's decision. Um, and it's also um, was in, in, by the US EPA um, then concluded to be not likely to be carcinogenic to humans based on typical non-occupational exposures. But there's been more research since. A paper in 2018 in the Journal of Environmental Health demonstrates glyphosate can accumulate in the tissues of mammals over time. That's humans. And there's scientific evidence that glyphosate can cause cancer in mice at high doses. A recent review published last year, also in the Journal of Environmental Health, highlighted that scientific analysis of glyphosate is few and far between, particularly around the effects of occupational exposure. Those conclusions showed it's likely that in the general population there's measurable glyphosate in their biofluids we're carrying it around inside us. And those who are occupationally exposed to glyphosate can have up to more than 10 times that amount in their system. And what's more frightening is that it seems that children exhibit higher levels of glyphosate than adults. Do we want our children walking through parks exposed to a potential carcinogen if it's not required? Do we want to endanger the lives of the people who spray the weeds when they have the greatest likelihood of suffering ill effects? And what about other consequences we couldn't even predict? The recent study we've all been sent by Jack Heinemann and colleagues from the University of Canterbury shows glyphosate induces a change in susceptibility of pathogenic bacteria to multiple antibiotics. Who would believe that? And what could it mean for human health? We need to lower expectations um, of a neat and tidy world and support innovative ways to tackle weeds, as Andrew has described, that save time and money but are not potentially dangerous to human health. I vote no for glyphosate, and I hope you all do, and I implore those councillors who are intent on a 0% rates rise to think about the children of the city and put them first. Thank you. Pauline. Thank you. Look, um, thank you, Councillor Coker, for presenting us with all that evidence and for doing that work. And uh, look, I'm just going to speak very briefly in support of what you've said, and particularly around the comments of uh, Jack Heinemann from Canterbury University, who's completed a study which found that bacteria develop antibiotic resistance up to 100,000 times faster when exposed <coughs> to glyphosate, and subsequently uh, having negative implications for medicine's ability to treat infectious diseases. This is really serious. If there's any risk of that, I'm not, I'm not supportive of continuing to use this where we do not have to. And Jody Brunning and Stephen Browning, two well-respected environmentalists, are highly critical of the EPA and the WHO studies into glyphosate. There's a growing body of evidence that mass scale use is adding to these risks. So, you know, um, I think that we need to, uh, um, it would be a terribly big backward step if we were to reverse the decision that this council made in 2016. Uh, we need to focus on innovation and research and development to develop alternatives. Uh, and Andrew suggested and indicated that this is indeed happening. Uh, there's a movement away from using chemicals and especially harmful chemicals. And this one is controversial. We talk about risk, but to me, 
the evidence that is plain and that Melanie's just uh, laid out for us, and I've listened to Radio New Zealand articles and read quite a bit about it, from well-respected researchers, there is evidence that there's risk. I'm not prepared to take that risk. We need to ensure that we have a safe environment for our ecosystems and for our children and for their children. We want Christchurch to be a smart, green city. We need to move away from chemicals which pose risk. So I will be supporting this today. Tim. Thank you. Um, Carol, just a question for you. If this is um, supported... Oh, we're, we're done with questions. Oh, is it? Mm. Oh, sorry. We're in debate. All right. Thank you. Anne. Yep. Um, totally. Uh, we'll be supporting this. And, and really, the resource that has already been put in by Council into developing alternatives to glyphosate um, is... We, we must take notice of that, we must appreciate it, and we must build on it so that going forward we can support local um, innovation, local uh, jobs, um, by uh, investigating and strengthening our local industry, and that's in um, offering alternatives to glyphosate. So the resource that we've already been putting in as a council needs to be acknowledged and strengthened going forward. Thank you. Aaron. Yeah, I'm a little torn on this one because uh, um, I'm a bit of a hippie at home. Uh, I do my garden spray free. Um, I've got 26 organic fruit trees and so on and so forth. So try and uh, walk the talk. But on the glyphosate, um, it's been around for a long time. And I was very anti-glyphosate until I sat on the uh, board of the Horticultural Society for a year and got a little schooled on uh, its use. and. Uh, and uh, they kind of, all of the gardeners were like, why are you so anti-glyphosate? Uh, so I started doing more and more research and that's when it gets really confusing because the EPA classified glyphosate as not uh, likely to be carcinogenic to humans, but one international scientific organisation, the International Agency for Research on Cancer, classified glyphosate as a group 2A, probably carcinogenic to humans. Um, it's never definitely carcinogenic to humans. It's always possibly or probably in even the court case. The one court case uh, where it was awarded uh, against Monsanto was in California. Um, and California's also classified coffee as carcinogenic. And if anyone's been to California, every toilet you'll use in um, a motel or a hotel has a sign on it to tell you that the chemicals that were used to clean that toilet can cause cancer. So these are the warnings that you get in California. So um, I do heed that warning in California that you might get from excessive, um, I don't know if you um, uh, have glyphosate fights when you're at work and stuff like that, but you probably shouldn't. Um, uh, you should be wearing your protective gear and using the recommendations that are on the paddock, I mean on the packet to uh, apply it. There's a reason why um, staff have suggested to use glyphosate around waterways and not the organic. Um, uh, compounds because uh, one's a lot safer for the waterway than the other. And I'll just finish on saying um, I hope everyone in the room that votes against using this um, only buys organic uh, broccoli and uses 100% organic broccoli, which is very hard to find, uh, because all broccoli is just swimming in glyphosate for pretty much its entire life. Uh, I eat a lot of broccoli, eat it most days, um, and I'm, I'm st <coughs> still, still, still here. So, um, yeah, stop eating broccoli and vote against. Sarah. Gura, thank you. Um, firstly, I'd like to thank the, those who took the time to submit on this issue. And just like Councillor Goff mentioned for the excess water charges, there was a strong and clear majority view. It was good to see the numerous links to formal peer-reviewed science come through from people concerned about the wide reintroduction of glyphosate and clear that we need to continue to take a precautionary approach to its use. However, references to research that said it was safe were simply studies funded, funded by Monsanto. It's not the occasional use that some may do in their own gardens that's the issue, as the US EPA specifically acknowledged, but the regular contact through spraying, usually by lower paid workers, that causes concern. Large corporations are not paying billions to settle out of court just for fun, and the court case that Councillor Kewan references, th that worker was actually following the directions on the label. The UN Cancer Agency ranks it as 2A, probably carcinogenic to humans. This is the second highest of five levels that they rank, 
and one study showed a 40% increased risk of developing the cancer non-Hodgkin lymphoma by those with high exposure through work. This is what is meant by probably. It's a significant increased risk, 41%. Yes, that's not 100% definitive, but I wouldn't want to be exposing council staff or employees or contractors to it. And it's not only the human health aspects that people were concerned about. New research on impacts on insects, including bees, and concerns over habitat destruction are also considerations. Of those who gave feedback on the issue, there was strong opposition to the reintroduction, even from many of those who preferred a lower rates increase. And I'm really glad to say that we've been able to listen to that feedback and change the proposal. There are few alternatives to broad spectrum herbicides for biodiversity reasons though, and so maintaining the exemption for its use in these circumstances is important. There were also submissions which asked us to use fewer sprays of any type and for us to have a rewilding of some areas in town. And if there are community groups with a specific proposal for an area to be trialled to encourage insect life, biodiversity and change perceptions on how we train nature for amenity, then please get in contact with us and let us know and we'll see what we can do. We've already made one decision today where people are going to question whether to, we have listened to them or not. Let's not do it again. Sam. I can be brief as well. I'm really thrilled that Sarah mentioned the submissions. It's just a shame we didn't listen to the thousand from the taxpayers' union from around Christchurch who wrote in wanting no zero rate increase. But I guess we can come back to that later on in the debate. I won't be supporting the mayor's point recommendation on this. No, well, I'm in debate. No, no, Actually, point of order takes I'm happy for you to continue. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, you've got a rule on the point of order. So, all right, what's the, what is the point of order? Uh, he was incorrect on the reference to my debate. It's a debate. No, actually, you have to be correct. Well, so are we debating your point hang, of order? Hang on, hang on. So the, point, so the actual point of order is? OK, so he was saying that I hadn't taken into account those who... No, I didn't. I said it's a shame you didn't listen. All right. So if there's a misunderstanding, you, you've, um, correct, you, you've made clear what you did say. Um, clearly, there's been a different understanding that your intention was not um, to infer that that was what had been said by Councillor Templeton. No, I quite clearly said it's a shame she didn't listen. I didn't say she didn't consider it. I was very clear that those people who submitted with, for lower rates also submitted for removing life None of this is a point of order anyway. Yeah, though. all right. Yeah. Are we Continu debating a continue, debate? with the, <laughs> continue with the debate. Yeah, look, all, all I was going to say after that uh, was that I won't support the Mayor's recommendations on this. There's risk in everything we do. You know, there's risk in getting in a car, although, to be fair, some of us don't like cars. Uh, and, you know, there's, there's a, I guess, a way you manage all of that stuff. And when Melanie said that we should think of the children of the city, I mean, let's be realistic about it. Let's think about the fact that their parents can't afford to put food on the table. So at every step, we should look at how we minimise additional rates at the moment. And I just find it bizarre that we aren't prepared to manage risk at a council in a pragmatic way. So I won't support the Mayor's recommendation. Thank you. So, uh, oh, James. Yeah, I'll, I'll be brief on it as well. But I'll, I'll just follow on and say, um, look, with a number of the, um, the results and scientific evidence, the jury is still out on it, um, and the carcinogenic properties appear to be comparable to high-level salt intake. Um, but, but that to one side, and it's also inert once it, it's sprayed. In a perfect world, if, there, if we didn't have to consider funding, I guess I would prefer to err on the side of caution and not use it, if I'm to be really honest with you. But in saying that, in the job of a councillor and a decision maker and a governor is, is to weigh up all the evidence and put it through a lens uh, on, on, on the scales of balance uh, to factor a, a, a Christchurch um, Inc. approach when we come to setting a budget. And I think I do see this as a budgetary issue where we've heard from staff and we know quite clearly that this isn't about whether glyphosate will be used or not. Glyphosate is used. Glyphosate, glyphosate still will be used irrespective of how you vote on this. The question is whether or not you put $3.2 million now uh, on, onto ratepayers again for glyphosate to still be, to still be used anyway. You will just um, give $3.2 million additional budget um, to, to a department which is uh, already using glyphosate. So um, I think from a budgetary perspective, on balance, it is not a wise decision. I'm focused on the financials and I'm not um, getting too carried away with some pretty um, inconclusive science on this. You know, we need to factor all things here, and all I can ask of a good decision maker is to make decisions based on evidence. And the evidence isn't really there, but the financials are. So I'd like to bank that $3.2 million. Uh, and of course, 
I, I would prefer to err on the side of caution and to find alternate ways to, to, to spray weeds if possible. Um, but I think, on balance, it's the right decision to make to not support the Mayor's recommendations here. So I um, support this resolution, um, and I note the strong support um, through the submissions process, um, and I'm sure that that has influenced our thinking um, as a result of hearing those submissions. Um, I do not support um, the reintroduction of an increased amount of, of glyphosate. If we're um, serious about being a clean, green, healthy, progressive city, um, then we wouldn't reintroduce glyphosate. If we take the risks to human health seriously, um, whether that's to workers or to the public, um, and you know, conversations around um, science which appears to support or probably supports or possibly supports, um, all of that, while inconclusive, um, leads me to take the risk to human health seriously, whether that's a probable, possible or likely risk. Um, I also note the advice from staff, particularly around the practicalities of reintroducing the use of more glyphosate in the context of contracts which have already been signed, equipment which has been already purchased, um, and processes which are already underway, and the time it would take to make those changes and the, the cost and the complication of making those changes. Um, so, again, if we take that advice, we wouldn't reintroduce glyphosate. I agree that if this was just a financial consideration, then it would be an easy decision to make. Or if we chose to give significant weight to the financial consideration and very little weight to the human health, city image and other outcomes, it would be an easy decision to make. Um, but this isn't just about the financial and economic aspects. Um, this is about those other wider health and um, city image considerations. So I'm very comfortable supporting the recommendation here, um, maintaining the status quo and not supporting the reintroduction of glyphosate and would, include, would um, encourage others to do the same. Yanni. Thank you. Um, I don't want to repeat everything that's been said in the debate on both sides, but let me just start off by saying um, I just want to acknowledge the Soil and Health um, Foundation and Jodie Brunning, who actually came down and gave a talk just recently in our city. There's been a huge amount of work and assessment done around the different ways in which glyphosate has been allowed to be able to be used in New Zealand. Uh, and I have to say, it did not fill me with confidence, the fact that our EPA uh, thinks it's okay. In fact, what I heard from the talks were that we really haven't adopted a precautionary principle and that we have a very weak interpretation as a country We've relied, we've relied on expertise from people that is uh, not directly relevant to the risk and the hazard that glyphosate possesses. So I'm really supportive of us not reintroducing glyphosate. Uh, I think actually it's really encouraging to hear the work that staff are doing around looking at new ways of dealing with our environment. And I think you know if we're really serious about the climate change emergency and we think about our ecology and our biodiversity, Think of the people that came in dressed up as bees into this chamber and gave us a pretty clear illustration of concern that they had. And certainly, as I understand it, there is a lot of research now coming out that glyphosate does have an impact on the ways in which bees are able to reproduce. And we need bees, we need pollinators, so I'm very against us reintroducing it. And finally, I'll just come to the, the financial issue. I, I find it extraordinary. I, I don't know how many family members have had people that have passed away from um, occupational um, uh, illness um, you know but my grandfather worked in air conditioning and anyone who knows about the risk associated with air conditioning uh, will know that there's some very deadly uh, harm that gets caused to people when they work their entire life in those industries with those sorts of chemicals and compounds so I think we should take a precautionary approach and I find it extraordinary that we can have a debate about a few million dollars of money going on our budget at the risk of harming our, our children and our current workforce versus putting on $8 million for million dollar luxury apartments in the central city. To me, this is a quarter of the cost of subsidising central city development 
for some of the most expensive properties in our city, and yet we can't find money. Some people are arguing that we don't have the money to afford to look to reduce the risk of causing harm to our children or maybe even to our existing population. So I won't support the reintroduction. I support the work the staff have been doing and I applaud those people that took the time to make submissions and provide us a considered view. Thank you. Mike, I'll come to you to um, close the debate. Thank you. Um, well, there's been some very good debate um, in support of not reintroducing glyphosate. And, and let's face it, glyphosate is a toxic weed killer. Um, and look, cities, countries around the world are actually, you know, starting to, to ban this toxic weed killer. And I don't know why we would consider actually taking a backward step now and reintroducing it. Reintroducing it. Um, and this is not about just dollars and, you know, making financial sense. This is about increasing the use of this toxic weed killer. Um, and, and I know you, you can look at all this scientific information and, and reports, but I think sometimes you actually need to start looking back at who commissioned the report to start with, um, and sometimes that ends up being a, a good reason you get the outcome you have with some of these scientific reports. Um, and, and so, you know, when you have this um, imbalance of information, sometimes you've got to take a really precautionary approach to this stuff, especially when we, we have some very strong evidence about what it, it does do. Um, I think Councillor Coker has, has actually given some excellent information to, to all of us about some of the concerns this have, and quite frankly, if, if you don't want to put the children first, well, do it for the bees then. Um, you know, and Aaron, maybe you should go to Pico. They do supply some pretty good organic food, including broccoli, so try that place. Um, <laughs> um, but look, I, I hope everyone um, supports what the majority of the submitters have wanted um, and do not um, reintroduce or increase the use of glyphosate um, and actually support these recommendations. Thank you. So I'll put the motion. All those in favour say aye. aye. Against? No. That's carried. We'll take a division on that one as well, please, if we can. Councillor Tableton. Aye. Councillor McClellan. Ooh. Councillor McDonald's? Nope. Councillor Johansson? Yes. Councillor Galloway? Yes. Councillor Daniels? Aye. Councillor Coker? Aye. Councillor Chin? Yes. Councillor Scandrit? Um, abstention. Councillor Major? No. Councillor Kewan? No. Nah. Councillor Goff? No. Councillor Davidson? Aye. Councillor Cotter? Aye. Councillor Chu? No. Councillor Turner? Yes. So that's 10 in favour and 5 against. So that's carried. Thank you. Now let's take an adjournment for morning tea. It's 11.15, so if we can come back at 11.30, at which point we'll deal with the Strengthening Communities Fund matter. So we'll adjourn till 11.30. Thank you.
So we'll, um, I'll call the, meeting, call the meeting back to order, we'll resume the meeting um, and we'll now turn to the next of the um, three issues that we consulted on, um, which is the increase to the Strengthening Communities Fund. Um, so Carol, did you have any comments to make on this? It's very clear, I think, As isn't it? Stands. On an amount, we've increased the amount, but it will be funded from the capital endowment fund, and there's no rates impact. All right, that's fine. Are there any questions on this? Um, so moved by Jake, seconded by Tim, and um, we'll now move to any debate. No debate. I'll put the mo I'll put the motion. All those in. All right, James. All right, so. J oh, please, not, not too right. um, I'm, I'm All right, great. No, I will vote against it. It's all well and good to say uh, that there isn't um, a, a cost because it's coming from the Capital Endowment Fund, but there is an opportunity cost. There are other things that then don't get done as a result of that. Um, being a councillor, you know, is a tremendous privilege, but I actually think sometimes the harder part of the job is learning when to say no to things. It's very easy to hand things out. It's very easy to up funding. It's very easy to hand out um, increased grants. But the fact of the matter is uh, we're going through a tremendously difficult time in wake of COVID-19. And I think our real job is to cut our cloth accordingly. We're expecting those in the community to cut their cloth accordingly. They have to, and so should the council. So yes, it will be very popular to hand out a, a, a grants increase to community groups that do tremendously positive work. But I believe the prudent move is to cut our cloth accordingly because that's what our community expects and requires of us right now. Thank you. Sarah. Thank you very much. Um, and Councillor Goff is right, we need to make some choices, and sometimes those choices are really hard. But we also need to look at value and not just cost. This is the same approach that we took with supporting businesses in our COVID environment. But in fact, we didn't consult on our support for businesses. We simply um, made a decision to give some free parking in the central city, and we made a decision to not charge um, rental space leases and those kind of things outside. And just like uh, councillors having to cut its cloth, um, community groups are having to cut its cloth, businesses are having to cut their cloth. We need to make these choices. We need to look at value. Our community groups have been as hard hit, if not more, than the businesses in the city, and they uh, deserve our support just as much, if not more, than the businesses in the city too. They provide support for our most vulnerable, those who are currently losing their jobs, those who um, are not able to uh, connect and, and um, in a way that others can. Uh, they support uh, uh, tens of thousands of people in our community, uh, and I'm really looking forward to us being able to support them in that work. Volunteer hours are incredibly uh, important for our communities, and for every dollar that council puts in, we get $5 worth back through those volunteer um, hours. And so I'm really happy to support this today, and it's why I put forward um, the proposal initially. Thank you. Melanie. Um, I wholly support an increase um, to the Strength in Communities Fund, and um, I'm very pleased um, that this is more than the 5% that we consulted on too. And of course the majority of submitters to the annual plan supported this as well. These funds are given to groups who are made largely or completely of volunteers doing wonderful work to support social and environmental aspects of the city and cultural, in fact, which is three of the four well-beings. Every dollar spent, like Sarah's mentioned, brings back many dollars of value, many of it, much of it unmeasurable. And the impacts of COVID have affected community groups. Many have severely reduced budgets due to decreased rents from facilities they might run, or they may be facing higher costs for providing community events that are crucial at this time for social cohesion. It's our duty as elected members to support these organisations that use these funds and support them when they need it most, and we need them the most. Thank you. Pauline. Thank you, and I totally agree with Councillor Goff. We're in a very, very difficult time post-COVID. We have also been in difficult times post-earthquake, and it's well recognised that um, Christchurch's strong communities at the time of the quake really, really helped us in our recovery. And that was a result of, partially, 
the council historically supporting our community organisations through our funding here, through community boards and through uh, advocacy. So um, I think it's correct that we signal that we recognise the importance of community organisations in any recovery and especially in times of no crises. Strong communities make healthy society and we have to respect close communities. Good, strong communities watch out for each other and care for each other, especially in mental health and well-being. And I think this is an incredibly important signal that we send to our people that our recovery comes from them and we're there to help. So I will be supporting this today. Anne? Yep. Um, <clears throat> kia ora, I will be supporting this as well. Um, we have actually a legislative mandate or responsibility to promote the four well-beings, as um, Mel has suggested, uh, mentioned already, and so we must take into account not just the financial impact of our decisions, but also the cultural, social, environmental well-beings of our community, and this is all about that. So uh, we need to, at this time, support those groups. We've come through COVID well compared to others, places, because of the network and networks within our community that have been resourced in the past. So let's strengthen that going forward. Sam. I think you'll be brief again. Look, I won't be supporting this. Um, already per capita we pay far more than any other big council across the country in terms of community funding and the only other stat that we lead is our per capita debt per resident on council. So I think we actually need to be far more practical and stop spending as much as we are, particularly in this environment, so I won't support it. Jake. Um, I just really quickly wanted to say not that, I just needed to do that to say. Um, I just wanted to say thank you, Phil. Always there with a the pat on the back. Um, I just want to say I'm really, really supportive of this. I do question, though, given that this is a, a tweak to something we consulted on as part of our uh, consultation document, how it could possibly be with an order to, to I mean, you know. Thank you. Jimmy. Because the COVID-19 pandemic, the lockdown, I think all the residents in this city and community, we have to face. <coughs> and also we review those council outcome, particularly those social, cultural, environment, even economic well-being, for well-being. We are partners with those the, uh, the community, particularly those the community groups. It's not that we're going to find it to them. Actually, they also, to assist the council, you know, we can achieve our goal. We can fulfill our duty to complain of the uh, complain of our uh, community outcome. For instance, like a resi resilient community, you know, to give people a strong sense of community, also active participation in civic life and a safe, keep the safe in a healthy community. Where the council, we alone, we can achieve. We can arrive at no, that's impossible. We have to, you know, to work in together, collaborate with all those the community. We can achieve uh, arrive our goal. So this uh, extraordinary time, and we work working together, and uh, we going to maybe specific among the uh, finding to name. We working together as a, a general partnership to achieve our common goal. So that's why uh, you know this. Uh, Five percentage, even up to the five hundred k. This is reasonable, so I fully support this recommendation. Mike, thank you. Uh, just quickly, uh, in response to, to Jake, um, obviously we seek advice on this well ahead of time, not in the last minute, <laughs> and 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 we were informed that this was not a significant change. Hence the fact that it's in front of us now. I'm glad you actually um, moved it. It's, Excuse me. Excuse let, me let's let you? the debate continue. Um, so, uh, this is actually quite straightforward, in my opinion, and, and we've had some, once again some very good debates from people supporting this recommendation. Not so much my colleague over there, but that's fine. Um, <laughs> that's a matter of opinion. <laughs> <laughs> um, but to me, it's, it's straightforward. This is whether you actually support community or not, um, and that is why I support it because I support community. Aaron. Yeah, this is, uh, this is an interesting one because uh, though I didn't disagree with it when it was at the 320, um, uh, we, um, we did have the increase by uh, 180,000 and uh, you know, that's 
a 40% increase, which at this table is not significant, apparently. Um, and just like when our rates go up over a few years by 40%, it's not significant. It's just a few cents here and there. Uh, so that often is the discussion. So I don't disagree with Jake that the percentage change wasn't um, insignificant. I, I thought it was a significant change, even though the quantum doesn't appear to be in the size of our budgets. But the real kicker for me is, and I went to um, our community liaison meeting yesterday in our ward, and, uh, and we heard from the different groups. The real kicker for me is that in our area, we don't get our fair share of this pie. We get the least amount per capita because we don't have the levels of deprivation that everyone else has, apparently, because of the way the mesh blocks are done. So uh, our, um, our poor well, people aren't as poor, apparently. So that's the way it goes. Um, so yeah, we'll be on the losing end of this stick again, but the main thing is that we'll get to put the most into this pot. If ever there was a time that we needed to strengthen communities and support community organisations, surely that time is now. Um, we're supporting the economic recovery. Um, we've already um, passed some resolutions in the early part of the um, COVID crisis to do that. Um, this is about supporting the social recovery. Um, that's what this is about, and that's the reason that I support it. So, um, Jake, you've already spoken. Tim, did you have anything you wanted to add? All right, so I'll put the motion. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Against? No. no. Let's take a division on that for consistency. We can just raise our hands if it's quicker. We'll take a division, please. <laughs> We've gone well so far. <laughs> Councillor Turner? Yes. Councillor Chin? Yes. Councillor Chu? No. Councillor Coker? Aye. Councillor Cotter? Aye. Councillor Daniels? Aye. Councillor Davidson? Aye. Councillor Galloway? Aye. Councillor Goff? No. Councillor Johansson? Yes. Councillor Kewan? No. So is that a yes or a no? <laughs> That's a not an overly convinced no. Oh. Councillor McDonald? No. Councillor Major? Yes. Was that a yes? Yes. yes. Yeah. Councillor McClellan? Uh, in spite of Mike's contributions, yes. <laughs> Councillor Scandrix? Yes. Councillor Templeton? Aye. So that's 12 in favour and 4 against. So that's carried. Thank you. All right. So now we've got some um, amendments to deal with. Um, so the first one of those, Mike, is one that you've put forward. We're doing yeah, the um, ones first, aren't we? Like, yeah. um, Oh, I could think have a or, oh, Aaron, are we dealing with yours first? No, no, there's a slight change. Uh, yeah. I emailed through, which I think Aaron will be happy to second. Yeah, so Mike and I um, spoke in the break and have combined our amendments into one to come up Excellent. with a workable solution for Thank all you. involved. So this should be pretty quick. Just put it to the vote. <coughs> all right, so this amendment in front of us then is moved by Mike, seconded by Aaron. Is that correct? Yep. Excellent. Um, are there any comments from staff about this? All right, so it's capable of being implemented if it passes, and you're that's comfortable great. with that? That's great. All right, that's fine, thank you. Um, any questions on this? Mike, anything that you wanted to um, say? Oh, just, just quickly, and um, look, I think this is a really good outcome. This shows we're listening to different communities. Obviously, the community that Aaron represents have obviously uh, voiced their opinion quite loudly about um, a signalised intersection, and also we've seen a lot of um, submissions actually from people that want um, the cycleway along there to be progressed more quickly. So I, I think we get a win-win. We know that actually by you know folding that intersection into the cycleway, we're actually get funding from NZTA, which we should always try to be doing with our transport projects. So it's really good to see this is going to be moving forward and we're trying to get a time frame in there to actually show that actually, although this is obviously quite a long cycleway, um, once the design and consultation is completed, we can get into that intersection area as well. So it's good. Excellent. Thank you. Aaron? 
Yep, pretty much what he said. Um, a number of people did submit again this year on the intersection upgrade itself, but along with that there were people mentioning the cycleway and even, and I've been getting feedback from people in my ward that are saying things like, um, if getting traffic light means we need to have a cycleway, they will uh, go along with that. So they're open to the consultation, and as the local councillor, um, I will be uh, going out supporting the consultation process to hear what the people of that area have to say about it. Thank you. Um, well, I'm just delighted that the chair of the appropriate committee and the ward councillor were able to work together in a collaborative way to come up with what, um, to me, seems like a very sensible outcome that progresses both of these projects. So um, that's, that's great. So I'll put the motion. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Against? That's carried. Thank you. All right, so then, Aaron, that deals with yours. You're, you're happy to withdraw, Aaron, the amendment that you were going to put forward. That's off the table now. Yep, that's fine. So, um, Yanni, um, this is Lancaster Park, and we've had some conversation about this prior to the meeting. This reflects that conversation. That's good. Um, is there any staff comment on this? Um, no, nothing further from this morning's comments. Essentially, um, naming the project explicitly in, in this annual plan is a relatively simple process. There is funding available from the residual funds that we're using to carry on with the remediation work at Lancaster Park post the vertical demolition. Um, and so that will give the public hopefully some comfort that they can see the project progressing. Um, and as discussed this morning, um, we have aligned funding in the, in the draft long-term plan that we're working on um, for, the first, for the first five years of the plan that um, picks up the approved spatial plan initiatives. Thank you. Um, are there any questions on this? Yanni, do you want to make some comment? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to move it. Um, yep. Thank you. We need a seconder. Tim? Yep, great. Uh, thank you. Um, look, um, the reason that I've put this amendment up is that I just wanted to acknowledge that the council staff did an amazing job with the demolition of the old Lancaster Park. And um, it, it was a real positive to that community, the way in which it was done. But the big question is what happens next? And that's what the community are really wanting to have visibility of. So I think. Having a dedicated project in our annual plan through our capital project on our capital project list is really essential to just give visibility to the community that things will keep progressing. The other advantage it, it has is that it means that um, there's two two things that we can consider not not today but by having the project in our annual plan is we can consider places like Phillipstown, which had, have had a huge growth of intensification of housing, can have some of that. Uh, funding that's contributed going back into the local area for a growth project. At the moment they can't because this isn't on our capital project list. And there'll be another decision making process to, to decide whether that's appropriate, but unless it's on the annual plan you can't even consider it. The second thing is that um, the government have announced funding for uh, sports and recreation for the COVID-19 recovery, and some of that funding is targeted towards areas um, uh, in lower socioeconomic areas uh, or areas of disadvantage where participation rates may not be as high as they could. And Phillipstown is actually, that inner city east Phillipstown area is, is probably one of the areas in our city that could benefit from this. So I think it, it sets us up to approach central government for support. It sets us up with the community to have visibility. Uh, and I think this is a really positive thing forward in terms of the park. This is one community after the earthquake that lost its local school, lost its, its key metropolitan asset, which was the stadium, uh, and that has, had, has not had a lot put back. So let's give that community some hope that something positive will happen by agreeing to this amendment today. Thank you. Thank you. Tim. Yeah, no, thank you. And um, um, thanks, Yanni, for putting this up. I think it's outstanding. One of the clubs that uh, covers this area, and this will be an oasis in that area, is Kashmir Technical. It's a sporting club. It's the largest sporting club in South Island, and uniquely it covers from decile 1 to decile 10. 
So I think that this could be a real plus for that community. And these kids and these families need this area in there, and I think it's so important and has my full support. Thank you. So I'll put the motion. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Against? That's carried. Thank you. Right. Um, before we move on to the remainder of the res recommendations, I've got a further amendment that I'd like to move, um, which is that we increase borrowing by 1.6 million. So if we can just get that in front of us. All right, now the reason for this is um, to bring the rates back to a 3.5% increase. Um, we'll take some advice from staff shortly. Um, in fact, let's t take some advice from well, can I get a second for this first? Pauline. Thank you. Um, so if we can now um, get some advice from staff, and I've got some questions as well. Um, so um, perhaps if I could start. So we haven't quite got the resolution up there yet, but the resolution, I believe, Andrew is going to say, increase borrowing by 1.6 million so that the excess water charge does not increase the rates from 3.5 to 3.8. OK. So the lack of support for it. Yeah. Um, can, so, I, can I just be clear that there is already provision in our rates for an excess water charge um, and has been there for a number of years, but it's only been collected, I, th I think, from one or two um, residents. So we, we do have it, it's just that we haven't um, been as targeted as we have done this time. So, so um, the staff and management view on this is very clear. We have a very strong principle that we should not be borrowing for OPEX. Um, the COVID was a very unusual situation and Council agreed to borrow specifically for the COVID impact on the loss of dividend and the loss of revenue. The result of that was that we ended up with an unbalanced budget that we have talked with you about previously. So staff do not support this borrowing because it was actually a council decision. It wasn't a COVID impact. Um, and so this water charge, it was introduced both to reduce excessive water use and to reduce rates. We were very clear in the CD of what the rates impact would be if this option was not supported. We clearly spelt it out that it was a 0.3% impact. And further to that, we all know that when we were deliberating on the content of the savings for the annual plan, that there was a $26 million that we need to find in the first year of the LTP, and that will be challenging. So in summary, um, there's three key reasons why we don't support this. Firstly, the principle of not borrowing for OPEX. Secondly, that we were very clear in the CD of the rates impact. And thirdly, that the um, LTP year one is very challenging. Thank you. Um, so just in terms of, um, as I have done with the other amendments, checking that this is capable of being implemented and that it doesn't breach any um, regulations or anything that we, we shouldn't be doing. Um, would this be considered material? This will be for Dan. You mean in relation to your... Oh, sorry. No. Yeah, in terms of significance, would this be considered material? Uh, no, I don't believe it would be considered material. Okay, and would it be considered financially prudent? Um, I don't think it makes any changes to our financial prudence, so I wouldn't be concerned by that either. And therefore, do you believe it would change the recommendation coming from the Audit and Risk Management Committee? No, I don't think. Did you say it would? I don't it, think it would change the recommendation. Um, Andrew, I'm not sure that's a fair question to ask. All right, that's, that's fair enough. Yeah. That's all right. Thank you. Um, all right, so are there any other questions on this? We uh, alluded to in the audit and risk um, reports yesterday, and I guess the update from Kim, around the having to resolve to be financially not 
uh, not, not a balanced budget. Do you have a view on our credit rating and I guess the additional impact we've already taken from borrowing more to, to bridge the gap? Any implications of that long term? Um, perhaps I can comment briefly on that. Um, you'll be aware that LGFA did increase the covenant, so we do have sufficient debt headroom in there. The S&P assessment of our credit rating will be done in about December 2020. Um, we don't know what view they're going to take of councils, local government and the COVID impacts at this point in time. But if I could add, sorry to cut across, um, Standard & Poor's don't look short term, they look longer term. So if we're showing that we have a robust and sound budget for the three year, three to four year period, that is what they'll focus on, not the immediate period. And so just for my own understanding, if we were to drop our credit rating, would that increase our borrowing costs? Yes, it would. It would. Okay, thank you. Anne. Thank you. Uh, my understanding is that we have been um, erring on the side of caution with our borrowing just, and on the conservative, even though we have the opportunity to be able to um, borrow more under the LGU. You're talking about th this council? Yeah. <laughs> no, well, I'm talking about this, this situation we're in now. So I'm just wondering, um, is that, is that is, am I understanding that correctly, that we've erred on the side of being conservative? Um, I wouldn't actually say that, <laughs> no. Um, you'll recall when we were doing the modelling for you, we put up all of those scenarios around the various levels of OPEX savings as we were arriving at the rates. Um, you know, it's challenging because our, our debt headroom um, is under pressure, not so much in this year, but in, in outer years. So I wouldn't say that we're being conservative, no. Thank you. Um, I'll speak to this. Um, this is exceptional. Um, it is unusual. But this has been an exceptional and unusual budget. We don't normally consult on an annual plan twice. Um, we don't normally do all the work that we've done for this annual plan in an annual plan that would be more akin to the sort of work that we would do for an LTP. This has been an exceptional budget which has been put together in extremely exceptional situations, not only exceptional for the council, but exceptional for the city, and in fact we're in exceptional situations worldwide at the moment. Um, the water charging, um, the excess water charges proposal, it's worth noting, was put out in the second draft consultation for this annual plan. It wasn't part of the first draft consultation. This very proposal, which is, was something that was been worked on for the long-term plan, the only reason it was brought forward was because of the exceptional situations that we were in that saw us needing to consult on a second draft. None of this is something that we normally do, and clearly there wasn't an intention to do it, otherwise it would have been in that first draft for the annual plan. It is right um, to make the link between the excess water use not been adopted today, the excess water use charge not been adopted today, um, and this particular amendment. Um, we set a parameter early in the piece around rates restraint, and this is absolutely aligned with that parameter. We're very aware of the hardship that people in our community are facing, and we're very aware of the desire to keep rates increases as low as we possibly can. This is absolutely aligned with that. Um, borrowing for OPEX um, is something that we wouldn't normally do, but in this budget we are already borrowing for OPEX. That's a decision that we've already um, made, or a decision that we made when we went out with the, the draft budget. Um, the borrowing, the additional borrowing that this amendment, if it passes, would create, um, we've heard, is not material in terms of significance. Um, remains within financially prudent levels, it remains within prudent ratios, and in fact it's worth noting that the overall borrowing quantum um, has dropped since the draft that we went out with, and this is well within the um, quantum of borrowing that we went out with for the, um, for the draft annual plan. I would make the point, and I'm going to invite Dawn just to make some comment in a moment as well, um, I will make the point that this must be seen as exceptional, um, that this must not be seen as precedent setting, but needs to be seen in the context of this being an exceptional budget that we've been putting together under exceptional circumstances and a further opportunity to find the right balance between outcomes and rates increases. Um, Dawn, I should have asked you to um, comment after Carol, but I will invite you to do that now. 
So I want to reiterate what my officers have said. Uh, this is not something that we would recommend in terms of borrowing for the groceries, I think is the line that Carol usually said to us. And we must think about fundamentally the longer term impacts that we're also going to have to do with. So my request of you as members, whatever decision you take, you must remember when we get into the LTP, you are going to have some very difficult and challenging decisions to make and you will not be able to kick the can down the road in that situation. And I wish to reinforce that matter. Okay. All right. So this would have the effect of bringing the rates um, impact in this budget back to a 3.5 per cent increase. Um, is there any further debate on this matter? Sam? Has there been a second about that? Thank you. And I mean, this has come yeah, as a bit, of a, a bit of a surprise, really. Um, I wasn't aware of it this morning. Uh, or that it even was being contemplated. I wasn't aware of it till 20 minutes ago. Right, well, that's fantastic. Okay, well, look, I mean, this is actually outrageous, and it speaks to a culture within council that we cannot sustain. The reality is we continue to borrow, we continue to spend, and we don't cut our cloth accordingly. What we've done today is the council have made a deliberate decision not to charge for water rates, you know, or for infrastructure around the water. Uh, all we're simply saying is that because we don't want to make that hard decision now, we'll put it on the credit card again. I don't think people understand. We are tapped out as a council. We've had to go back to LGFA to lift that lid again. We can't keep doing it. It's not fair on future generations. And I think what people lose sight of is the fact that we're already in a low interest rate environment. But the reality is we won't be like that forever. There are real costs to this money, and I think people need to begin to appreciate that debt isn't free. And I think, you know, Andrew, I'm not, this isn't a job at you at all, but as the Chair of Finance, setting the culture of this within council, I think this, this amendment is entirely inappropriate and not healthy for the future direction of council. Sarah. Uh, yes, this has been an exceptional annual plan, but councillors were really clear when we made the decision today on water charges that we had consulted on it with an attached rates impact and that if councillors voted against the excess charges, they were voting in favour of the rates increase. Making a last minute change against staff advice is not acceptable and only makes our job harder next year. Uh, James. Thanks. Um, look, I can't support a resolution where the answer is you just borrow more. The answer needs to be you just have to spend less. Borrowing yet more again for OPEX is simply charging up the credit card to buy niceties when you can't afford to pay the mortgage. This approach is a mugs game in my opinion and I think that uh, it would be a direct, it is a direct abdication of our fiduciary duties to take this approach. You know, the word exceptional has been used to support this amendment and I'd agree with that but I'd go further. I'd call it exceptionally short-sighted, exceptionally poor financial governance and exceptionally daft. Uh, absolutely not supporting this at all. Tim. Thank you. Um, this is the second surprise for me in about 24 hours. Um, the first one being obviously the press release of CIAL and its investment, large investment in um, Otago. Um, I would have had an open mind on this, but I think we need to have a bit of a um, think about our entire strategy with the, all the stable of our um, CCHL stable. Um, I, as um, Sam said, you know, we just cannot keep going back to the credit card and if interest rates go up, I think our payments now are about 115 million per annum with regards to the servicing of our debt, current debt. We've got to stop and we've got to start having an overall strategy with all our family. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Aaron. Yeah, just over an hour ago, this council table had the opportunity for rates not to go up. And uh, when we had consulted on the water charging, two thirds of the people that come back to us on it said to go ahead and do it. Um, this table opted not to do that for their own reasons. Um, so by ignoring them, you by default put rates up and now you can't just put them back down by loading the credit card. So um, sayonara to lower rates, what must go up must come down. Not always true when it comes to rates. Jake. Oh, I just wanted to quickly say the water issue is done. Um, so councillors that choose to vote against this now are voting, in fact, to put up rates. Any further debate? All right. Um, I mean, my motivation for putting this in front of council was to provide an option if indeed there is a desire to take that option. Um, it's right that we should debate it. We've done that. Um, I'll put the motion. All those in favour say aye. 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 Against? So that's not carried, that's lost, and it consistently we'll call for a division. Yes? OK, 
Councillor Tableson? No. Councillor McClellan? Um, yes. Councillor McDonald's? Uh, definitely not. Councillor Johansson? Yes. Councillor Galloway? Yes. Councillor Daniels? Carl, no. Councillor Coker? Carl, no. Councillor Chin? Yes. Councillor Scandrix? No. Councillor Major? No. Councillor Kewan? And no. Councillor Goff? No. Councillor Davidson? No. Councillor Cotter? Yes. Councillor Chu? No. Councillor Turner? Yes. Six in favour and ten against. So that's lost. All right, so we um, now move to the balance of the Mayor's recommendations, um, which I'd indicated we would move as a block. So I'm happy to move these Mayor's recommendations. Do I have a seconder? James Daniels. All right. Um, is there any comment required from staff on these? Nothing? All right. Um, no questions? Any debate? I'll put the motion. All those in favour say aye. Right. Against, as carried. All right, so now we are in a position to reinstate standing orders, which I'm happy to move. Um, Sam is happy to second. All those in favour say aye. aye. Against, as carried. And the next resolution is to adopt attachments D to G, clauses 2.5 to 2.9, um, which again I'm happy to move. Do I have a seconder? Mike Davidson. All those in favour say aye. aye. Against, that's carried. No. Sam voting against. We'll just note a vote against from Sam MacDonald. Oh, um. yeah, no, oh, sorry, sorry. The, uh, it's the it's not it's all, it? so Yes. You rattled through that one pretty quickly there, Andrew. <laughs> um, right, so, um, it's no. So people thinking. are voting against. Who's voting against? Okay, that's fine. All right, so that's um, carried. And then we've got. Yeah, can you note those again? Thank you. So those that voted against Sam McDonald, Catherine Chu, James Goff, and Aaron. Aaron Keown. I can itemise it if you want, but or if. if All right, so, so that's CAPEX and OPEX schedule primarily. That's carried. Um, and then attachments D to, uh, no, that's the one we've just done. We've resumed standing orders. We've resumed standing orders, yeah. So then we um, are moving, so I'm happy to move clause. Carol's indicating to you. Sorry, Andrew. Um, so we, we do actually need to take a break to recalculate the um, impact of the 3.8 per cent. And so I'm just checking with Diane here, but I do believe this is the point yes. that we need to take the break and recalculate the numbers for you. Um, yeah, so, so we've done everything that we need to do. You've now got work to do on the back of what we've done to bring back some final numbers for us, yes. and they'll be the numbers that we adopt when we um, pass Resolution 2.1, um, which is to adopt the whole annual plan. And that's where there'll be the opportunity, obviously, to debate the whole annual plan at that time. All right, so um, it's now quarter past 12. Dawn's going to be out until... Two. Just before two. So two o'clock. So if we adjourn until two, um, and then we'll be in a good position to um, finalise this quite quickly um, when we come back at two o'clock. All right. So we'll adjourn till two o'clock. Thank you. The stuff that it takes.
Right, thank you. So we'll resume the meeting. Um, and before we broke, um, Carol, you and the team were going to crunch the numbers. So if we can get an update on that, please, now. Thank you. Sure. Um, so as we signalled earlier, the um, average rates increase has moved from 3.5 up to 3.8. Um, what that means for a standard residential home, or the average house, is that the rate increase is 2.09. For business, it is 3.34. And for remote rural, it is 4.59. Five, nine. Sorry, can you, get those can you just run again? through those yeah, again, please? Thanks. Yeah. Sure. Thanks. So, sta average house or residential, 2.09. Average business, 3.34. And remote rural properties, 4.59. And if we can get that in dollar terms as well? Oh, sure. So, average house. A dollar twelve a week, fifty-eight point oh nine a year. Average business, eight dollars twenty-six a week, four hundred and twenty-nine seventy-seven per year. And remote rural per week, two dollars fifty-eight, and per year one hundred and thirty-four dollars and eleven. I can circulate that around as a table for you. Yeah, yeah, that would be really good. If we can get that sent out by email to everybody so that people have got it in front of them, that would yeah. be great. Thank you. Yes, and as Diane's just pointed out, the resolutions have all been updated and um, we've got those updated on the screen in front of you now. All right, thank you. All right, so are there are any questions on what we've just heard. I mean, it really is a factual update um, based on the decisions that were made this morning. All right, so um, I'm then happy to move um, resolution 2.10, um, which is that we adopt the annual plan. Mike, you're happy to second that? Thank you. All right, um, so now we'll move into debate. And what I might do is just go round the table as we have done in the past. Um, everybody doesn't need to speak to this if they don't want to. Um, I'm assuming many will. Um, and we'll have three minutes per person for the um, debate. This is on the whole annual plan. And then we've got a number of other resolutions that flow on from this, which are largely procedural, um, after we've um, concluded this debate. Sarah. Just process-wise, I'm just wondering now that we've got the um, the financial implications of uh, the water um, excess charge decision actually in front of us, whether there was a mind to yeah. test the room to see whether everyone's still now that the fully the now that it's clear that the residential's gone from 1.77 up to 2.09, um, whether people were of a mind to to revisit that decision. Can we just see? We just doesn't need a full vote, but just maybe a bit of a test of the room to see whether people wanted to have another look at that. It would take a 75%, 75 but which That's I don't right. think is likely, but I just wondered if it, now that we've got the full information, whether that was worth retesting. Um, so it would require a 75% majority yep. to overturn the resolution. Yep. Within the meeting. Uh, yeah. Yep. I, so that I, would. Can I just point out what um, standing orders says? Yeah. Thank you. <coughs> a meeting may revoke or alter a previous resolution made at the same meeting where, during the course of the meeting, it receives fresh facts or information concerning the resolution. Yep. In this situation, 75% of the members present and voting must agree to the revocation or alteration. Yeah. Yeah. 12 members. Be clear right. which resolution are we talking about? So this is the resolution the on the excess, excess water charge. Um, so, I mean, the question really is, if there was a desire to do that, um, would there be 78? Would, would there be 75% in favour of doing so? That's 12 members. So that would be 12. Yeah, yeah. So there's uh, four to change the nine who voted against. Mm -hmm. 
Well, what about your ending with though, Andrew? <coughs> if we're going to do that, should we not do yours as well? Well, no, I mean, I'm comfortable that, you know, we, we put that and it, it, was, it was dealt with in the way well, that it was. It sounds like some people do want to relive the game. Well, yeah. I mean, there are, there are a number of ways of achieving an outcome. That was one of them. Um, this potentially is another. Um, I mean... What's the friction? So what, what's the new information? Yeah, exactly. The table the which is in front rates, of us. rates impact for residents of the decision. But we already, we already knew that. Yeah. No, no, we knew that there would be a 0.3. We didn't know that that would take it from 1.77 to 2 point, over 2% 2 for residential. We didn't have yeah, we, all of those numbers crunched for us. Yeah. I mean, I knew it. We, we knew that it would go up. Yeah. I'm just yeah. wondering I'm not sure if what worth. the new information actually is. Oh. Don't get me wrong. I'd be happy yeah, to, it's still to change it. <laughs> yeah. So, can I just get a sense from the room of whether <laughs> there is a desire to go down the path that Sarah has um, suggested? No. Okay. That's, That's what I'm meaning. Yeah. I'm, I'm, uh, 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 yeah. So we're not going to relitigate that. No. That's fine. No. Just checking. Yeah. No. no, that's a good point. But that's a very good point. Yeah. Yeah. I actually think it's a. That's a terrible thing to even consider. I know you were, were allowed to do it, mm -hmm. but it's not a good look. <coughs> and and I don't yeah. I'm okay. Not let's let's not further debate it. it. Given that it's not supported, let's not further debate it. Um, again, you know, it, it was an opportunity which has been put out there as an opportunity. Um, we'll we'll not proceed with it. All right. Move to bit. So the um, resolution has been moved and seconded, so now we'll move to debate. Um, my intention would be just to go round the table, starting with James, finishing with um, Mike. Um, so, James. I'll stand aside for the moment. I'm not ready. Okay. Right, OK. Well, I'll come, back, I'll come back to you towards the end in that case. Pauline. OK, thank you. I'll kick away. Look, and I am really sorry that we were not ready to bring an excessive uh, volumetric water charge. Um, however, an equitable system for our society is very important to protect our most vulnerable, as they're always the casualties if we have inequitable policies, and that's my view. But look, I'm just going to speak generally. This amended LTP has reflected a huge amount of work both by staff and by us as elected members. I mean, just take the level of debate today over three main issues and basically multiply that by a thousand. You might have a fair idea of what we've been through in the last few months. But look, I'm really proud at the end, of the end result. Um, and the complimentary and even high praise, if I may say so, from the Audit and Risk Committee Chair on the process, the level of risk and assurance in this annual plan is, is remarkable. When Kim compared Christchurch post-COVID um, annual plan to Auckland, I was momentarily thinking she was going to say ours was better. Uh, however, I'll take it equally good as a compliment for this organisation. And I wish to thank and recognise the staff for all the work and at the risk of naming one person, and I'm not reducing the ability and commitment of others, but I'd really like to commend Peter Ryan in particular. I think he's carried a big load in this. And in his words, they and we produced firstly a draft annual plan in February, continued working up the uh, long-term plan, then a post-COVID amendment annual plan in a condensed time frame with massive challenges of revenue reduction and now straight back into the long-term plan work. All interwoven, but staff's ability to be flexible and innovative has been exemplary. And I'd also like to thank our Chief Executive who took us all on this together, ensuring that elected members had extraordinary access to incredible detail of our operational expenditure and capital programme to a higher degree than we've ever had. It's been fantastic to have staff, the Chief Executive and elected members working so closely all together as a well-functioning team to deliver this annual plan in such challenging times. And even though we've landed slightly higher than we intended, it's not, to me, significantly higher, and we have uh, reached a consensus. So um, I commend everyone who's been involved in this process so far. Thank you. Thank you. Sarah. It would be fair to say that councils across the country have been stuck between a rock and a hard place this annual plan. Our communities are reeling with the after effects of the COVID-19 lockdown and many are still unsure what the next few months will bring with their jobs. Yet at the same time, council has had a huge drop in income from our CCOs and facilities. However, we have, a massive, we have massive pressures on our infrastructure as our roads and water still need extensive work to get them up to a standard that we can be proud of once again. Finding a balance between supporting the residents who need it most and still providing a pipeline of work to give confidence to a construction sector has not been easy. Around 4.4% of jobs in Christchurch rely on the council in some form, and we do not want to add to residents' unemployment woes unnecessarily. We have heard from the Audit and Risk Committee Chair and Deputy Kim and Sam that this annual plan process was a good one and that it is financially prudent. We have cut our cloth carefully, but we do not want to rip the fabric of our city to shreds. 
This was never going to be able to be an all or nothing budget. A billion dollar balancing act is not as simple as some would argue, but I think we've managed to get there. We have a rates relief package to support those who have lost income due to the crisis, while those of us who are still unaffected pay our fair share. It is simply not fair to kick the can down the road for ratepayers to pick up the costs of sweated assets or unnecessary borrowing, and no one is going to thank us for it. I'm not happy that we've ended up at 3.8% today instead of 3.5%, but I recognise that it's part of the democratic process and that to vote against the entire plan now because I don't like it would simply be a political game instead of the collective governance that our city needs and expects. As bad as COVID has been, our biggest challenge is yet to come. Climate change, risk and resilience needs to be the focus of our long-term plan. It's not going to be easy, but the costs of mitigation and adaptation now are more than outweighed by the costs of inaction. We have a choice about our future. Let's think ahead and make it the right one. Tim. Um, thank you. Um, yesterday morning I was really uh, kind of clear of where I was going to go. Um, then uh, some changes happened yesterday afternoon. Um, I was very clear with the water charges. We have to make it start somewhere, and I think it was um, a good proposal. Glyphosate. I was really in two minds about that, but once that information came through, I felt I could not impose an extra charge on um, ratepayers when this council and its family of companies weren't doing it themselves. So I, I um, abstained from that one, and strength in communities goes without saying. I totally support that. But I, I do want to thank Andrew, our Deputy Mayor, for leading us through this process and taking up the reins, and thank you, Andrew and um, our Chief Executive Dawn for, for leading your team and the general managers, etc. The work that has been done, I totally understand, has been huge in a very tight time frame. Um, but for me, um, I am going to abstain from this vote because um, it was somewhat ruined for, for me yesterday afternoon. I thought we had, as a council, sent a really clear um, direction to our company, CCHL, and those companies under it as a family to say we must tighten our belts. And I can't ask our ratepayers to um, sustain um, increased rates when we're not leading and not being listened to. So I'm sadly going to um, abstain from this vote. I'm really disappointed. Thank you. Aaron. Jeep is not sure how I follow that, Tim, but um, I can it. feel uh, Tim's, Tim's mood. Um, my one this year is one of, uh, I think uh, my mood's one of frustration. Um, I think uh, at the moment we faced an opportunity. I know in the media it constantly gets called a crisis because that helps sell newspapers and makes you watch at six o'clock, but um, I don't see it as, uh, as much a crisis as an opportunity for our country to return to its rightful place. Normally, being at the bottom of the world is a curse. At the moment, it's a blessing. Um, we have, uh, I think the government's man managed us well as far as the, um, the containing COVID. Uh, our economy has an opportunity now to um, essentially uh, put us in a better position than we would have been without COVID. And I really mean that because there's a lot of opportunities out there. Once upon a time, New Zealand was, um, had the third highest GDP in the world. That was in 1950. Now we sit around 23. Uh, it's not as good a ranking as we should be. Uh, the rest of the world's locked down and cannot work properly right now. We should be accelerating a number of industries, um, aiming for zero unemployment. Uh, not uh, looking after our people by handouts, but by hand ups and having a country that really, really excels in being the envy of the world. We once were, we should be again, and that's the way I see our, um, our annual plan, as it's one that didn't take opportunities. Uh, there was, the horn was sounded for a potential 0% rates rise. Uh, a lot of people uh, uh, reacted to that and liked the sound of it, but then when the when the draft document went out, it didn't have that option in there. That wasn't an option for the people of the city. People come in and said, oh, we understand why your rates are going to be this. But they, because the information was not, I don't believe, accurate in the draft document. It should have had a 0% option in there. And then what would that look like? What were the cuts we needed to have made to get there? Um, so I'm not happy in the sense that we went out 
and uh, consulted on something that, yes, was achievable, but more could have been achieved by this council. And uh, I, I believe in this place and I believe in the people of the city uh, and I believe that our recovery can be more than just an economic recovery, it can actually be um, growth. So uh, here's up to your glass being half full, um, just put water in it now that we don't charge because you won't be able to afford much else. Jake. Unless you get charged, in which case you definitely can't afford much else. I just wanted to thank everyone. Um, <coughs> this has been a really fun <coughs> process, particularly as a new councillor. I don't know what it's been like before, but I appreciate the level of detail it, uh, to, that we've been able to delve into, and I appreciate that's different to how it's been done in the past. I appreciate an opportunity to delve into the OPEX as well. Um, I also wanted to appreciate um, uh, your work, Andrew, for, for cheering us through the entirety, uh, essentially, of, of the process and for giving us an option today to stay at 3.5 if we so chose it. Um, there's been an amazing debate today. I think all, all the subjects have, have been really colourful and, and well explored, and it's a shame that we haven't been able to get consensus on each and everything, but um, we've, we've got to where we got to. And, um, yeah, I would, I would hate to see this... This, yeah. No, anyway, that's, that's all I've thought of. Phil. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you, staff. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, um, Dawn and um, Andrew. This is, this is new for me as well as is for six others of us. And uh, I didn't believe that we'd be going into it this deep. And apparently we didn't in previous years. But if this is the way it's going to be, this is great. Bring it on. I'm looking forward to the LTP. <laughs> um, one thing that... Um, some things that I wanted to chop didn't get chopped some in that, that slide, but one thing I'm very passionate about is that we've actually increased the um, budget for smoothing of roads, because one of the biggest gripes I get mainly out in the East, but everyone does, is the low satisfaction of, um, at 26% on here, of um, how smooth roads are. Now, um, with Mike's, uh, Mike mainly got it, but we have got an extra four and a half million dollars for smoothing roads. Um, I feel that we do, we're better to do more smoothing of asphalt than just running around spraying chip seal on something that's a little bit uneven and messy. So I'm really looking forward to going with the roading guys going ahead and getting our roads a lot, a lot better. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Kia ora. So our council has been placed in an incredibly difficult position due to COVID-19. Dividends down, loss of revenue from our um, closed facilities, unexpected extra costs, sending recyclables to landfill. We found ourselves in a very different place than when we put together our original annual plan in February. So a huge amount of work has been done to address the impacts of COVID-19 of this crisis, both on this organisation and on our communities. Thank you to our Deputy Mayor and our CEO especially for the work done and our ELT, who have put in an enormous amount of work to identify um, savings across every part of the organisation. Thank you. Your work has, is enormously valued. We couldn't have done this without you. Uh, the challenge has been to ensure that we are continuing to offer the right services to our residents while continuing to support our city and its economy to recover from this terrible pandemic. Staff have presented options for reworking the budget to us and we have made informed decisions uh, where this council will spend its money and the level of service it will provide. The draft annual plan presented to our communities was a result of this process. And following feedback, changes have been made and we have this annual plan that we are considering today. The rate of 3.8 is higher than we had hoped, but it supports our government's both national and local for economic recovery and to support employment and to continue to build infrastructure. We have, we have avoided severe impact on our services, maintenance and capital works and job losses within the organisation, I believe less than five. We have avoided being a tr having to trigger an LTP process because of the impact of lowering um, drastically levels of service. Sadly, however, any rates rise is going to have uh, to add a financial burden and stress to, to many who are already facing this at this time. So it is really reassuring that we have been able to include a significant comprehensive rates relief package in this uh, budget, in this annual plan. 
Council um, will continue to provide rates relief through an extension of time available to make rates payments due to financial hardship caused by COVID-19. Finally, many submitters to the draft annual plan challenge Council to consult with communities in a more open and collaborative way. The most recent residents survey revealed that respondents felt that they can't engage with Council's decision-making processes. I'm delighted that the Mayor is, rec is proposing a, re a residence forum to identify barriers for engagement and to help guide the Council as we work with our residents um, over issues such as the water um, discussion that we had this morning. I look forward to working closely in partnership with my fellow residents to address the serious issues that we are all facing as we go forward. So I'm very supportive of this today. Thank you. Thank you. James, I'll come back to you now. Kia ora koutou. Uh, to Mayor Tuatahi, the first thing is uh, I want to acknowledge the staff led by the CE for all your preparation and advice that was not always taken by Council, uh, but it is appreciated that, uh, and you'll appreciate that that's the way the system works, but I appreciate that uh, all the mahi that you've put in to get us to this point. Um, in February, I was open about supporting a zero rates increase, and we were in the process of of consulting on a 4.65% increase, and I thought it should have been, could have been, and should have been lower. Then a month later, we have COVID-19 hit us, and the effect of that is in the pocket. We've had a financial hit already in this financial year, and we'll have another one next year. Notwithstanding that, we've consulted and been through the process and landed today on 3.8. Ipso facto, therefore, 4.6 was too high before. I rest my case. I have to acknowledge that I had told a lot of people that I was um, going to support um, uh, extra charges on excess water, but because of the debate we had here this morning, I um, changed my mind on that. Uh, but I do um, support our recommendations on glyph glyphosate and uh, SCF, the Strengthening Communities Fund. So I will, at the end of the day, support 3.8. Kia ora. Thank you. Sam. Yeah, th <clears throat> thank you very much. Um, look, I think if you think about it from the outset, uh, some of us took a particularly hard-line view on zero rates, and if for nothing else, it sparked a really good conversation in the city in terms of what our council can do differently. Uh, and I was really optimistic of that, knowing that, like everyone says, politics is the art of compromise. And I did... Uh, well, I was quite optimistic in the view that we started at 4.65 and actually we may have landed somewhere in the middle. Uh, we still haven't, you know, and in the end, uh, I think we as a council have made a, a range of views, a range of decisions which have been collectively bad for the city. They haven't been evidence-based. Uh, they have been, uh, you know, front page of the paper type things. And I think in the end, we can't keep abdicating. Uh, and, you know, I've sort of been criticised for trying to incite austerity or, you know, sensationalise a lot of this stuff. Um, but, you know, I think we need to have an honest conversation with the public in terms of where we're going forward from here. You know, our debt ceiling, we've had to go back to LGFA to fund that. And you can argue all you like that, you know, in the end we can keep borrowing. Uh, but there are fundamental underlying issues with the structure within council. And I just think at the moment, in a time of, you know, economic crisis, if we look back to that very first outcome, it should be, do we want to burden the ratepayers anymore? And we didn't, and we shouldn't, you know. But I think, um, you know, we've, we've landed in a position today which for me is still far too high. I think probably the, uh, and I do agree with what Sarah said about the process uh, and the Audit Risk Committee, and I do want to thank Dawn and Andrew for, and Carol and the team for working through it. Um, it was a very good process. And, but looking back, there's probably one thing that jumped out for me. It was that Saturday when we all sat in here going through the operating expenditure, and I fought like buggery uh, for us not to know the cost-saving number. And we did put it to a vote. Uh, but the moment we knew that we got to 23 million, I watched the room, the mood room, uh, the mood around the, uh, the table change. And I think that's a really good learning for next time: is that, you know, we shouldn't just aim to get to a number. We should be really focused and really disciplined on how we get to a certain position. So, look, I, I don't want to be negative again. I feel like I've sort of had six months of uh, criticising the council on this, but I still fundamentally believe that we have underlying structural issues at council, and that when we're in a position like this. Uh, where we need to go back out to the public and ask for more money until we can demonstrate that we have our own house in order. We, sh we simply shouldn't be doing that. So I, I don't support this today. Uh, you know, and hopefully we can get to an LTP where I can, but I'm, uh, I should be far more optimistic by then. 
Thank you. Catherine. Yeah, I won't be supporting this today either. Um, as a new councillor, the process in itself was very eye-opening for me. Um, and I, there were lots of um, healthy debate going on. I agree with Phil, though. I think there were a lot of things that we could have cut further that we didn't, weren't just bold enough to make that step. Um, my biggest concern is with a recession looming and extensive job losses and the threat of continued hardship, the least that we could have done for our residents was to guarantee a zero rates increase. And I know um, some elected members might think that the rates increase of 3.8% might just be a latte a week, but actually residents and our businesses are already struggling to pay the existing rates um, level. Um, and this is just a further blow. And I think it's on us as a council for not being bold enough and not taking leadership in, in making financially responsive decisions. Thank you. So I won't be supporting it today. Melanie. Um, well, the process to get today has been a long one and an interesting one. Um, the impacts of coronavirus are not fully clear, um, and there have been immense, obviously, on Council's um, dividends and uh, as well as on many sectors in New Zealand. And although no one ever wants to pay more for a good or a service, I support the annual plan as it stands, which includes the overall rates increase of 3.8%. It is 2.09% for the average household, and for households worth over 3 million, it's only 1.09%. As a council, we've managed to reduce the total operational budget by a total of 32.1 million compared to last year, which is huge. And we've done that with increasing funding for the community, increasing money for smoothing roads, which the community have been asking for, and also not bringing back glyphosate for general use. And I'm proud to support all of these and support the position of my community board, Sprade and Kashmir, which included all of these in its submission to this plan. One of the oral submissions that most stood out to me um, focused on the importance of the community services provided by Council. Our libraries, our pools, recreational facilities, community spaces. These are the face of the Council to the community, our family, elderly and our young people. Those who are more well off may not need to use public facilities as they have their own libraries and pools, but people I have spoken to understand the financial position of Council and realise that a relatively small increase in rates, especially in the light of COVID-19, is well worth it to retain such wonderful assets to our city they get so much value from. And unfortunately, and I am going to be negative here, but some councillors sitting around this table indicated during this thorough process that one option they would consider to reach 0% rates rise would be to close six libraries, including those within their own wards. However, they're happy to give away millions of dollars to developers, not keen to increase revenue by increasing car parking charges, and they wish to retain directors' fees rather than give them to those most in need via the Mayor's Welfare Fund. They would also prefer to spray potentially dangerous chemicals in neighbourhoods to save a few dollars, despite three of these councillors being representatives on the Canterbury District Health Board. Amazing. I'm sure they are likely they can afford their own health insurance, but are not prepared to protect those who have less means than themselves. This concerns me for the long-term plan and the areas that might be targeted for reductions in capital and operational expenditure. And in my role as a councillor, I want to use equity as my guiding principle, and I don't mean the equity in the way that an accountant might be thinking of, but the meaning of the word equity that achieves fairness by treating people differently dependent on need, in other words, targeting assistance to those that need it and not to those that don't. I support this resolution and look forward to future debates on the LTP. Yanni. Thank you. Um, so I, I too want to acknowledge the work that everyone's done, staff and the elected members and um, the, the chair. Um, uh, but you know, for me, I think we lost an opportunity to really engage with our community. And at the start of this process, I made the point that you know, imagine if we did something similar to share an idea with our COVID-19 response and actually took the time, which was an option available to us, to the end of the year to work through a really collaborative process with our community to work out what our priorities should be. The reality is, and someone else has mentioned it, we're in a very dynamic environment. Every day, our circumstances are changing, uh, and even over the life of this very short consultation, what we've seen is that um, things like CCHL dividends have been revised, meaning that a lot of stuff that we went out with actually was, wasn't as relevant as it possibly could have been. So I think, you know, unfortunately that option wasn't taken. That would have actually given the rates relief because it would have kept the existing rates levels until we'd concluded that at the end of the year. But I accept that that process wasn't the agreed process and this is the process that we have. 
I think for me, um, there's still a huge amount of people in our communities that we are not hearing from, and I think that's a real concern. And when we talk about um, you know, some of the things that we're spending money on, and then we're being asked to consider the impact on people, I find it extraordinary that we've spent almost no time talking about the things that we're spending a huge amount of money on. Hundreds of millions of dollars going into rugby stadiums and, and $50 million going on a new airport, if not more, and yet we've been really looking at very small costs that we're faced with as a city. So I think there's still a lot of work to do. I appreciate that the LTP will be an opportunity to do it, and also that our CCHL, our letters of expectations and our statements of intent to all the council companies have a huge role to play. I still believe that we actually spend a lot of money, uh, and if we were smarter about how we spent that money, we would get better value. And I think we really haven't even started to, to look at that, but I know some councillors around this table have raised that concern around asphalting of roads, for example. The critical thing in here is we are putting money in to fix our huge infrastructure backlog. And I will support this today because one thing I know is that we're still recovering from the earthquake in terms of our infrastructure deficit, and we must continue to spend money to make sure that the broken suburbs and broken communities are having some investment to try and get on top of our huge maintenance and amenity issues. So I will support this today. I do signal that through the public consultation, we heard overwhelmingly that people were still concerned that those who were the most well off and at the top are still not contributing their fair share to the fallout that we're faced with. And I look forward to having a really good discussion in the future around how we look at rebalancing and getting to a much more equitable way in which we distribute the cost. Thank you. Jimmy. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. In response to the COVID-19 pandemic lockdown, so this year the annual plan actually is the, the probably longest time period uh, we through all the, the process. Particularly, we are all aware we have two times uh, dropped the those the annual plan. We go to the uh, public consultation, but I respect the, those the, uh, process because we are less open, transparent uh, the uh, process. So even the result, you know, maybe some of the issue, some items, we, you know, we have uh, disappointed, but I respect, accept uh, this uh, process. And also, the, actually, you know, during all the, the discussion, we have actually still discussed some uh, critical, uh, significant uh, issue. For instance, like uh, glyphosate, whether we consider to reuse or not, or we just consider to save the, the, the budget cost of three and a half or three point two, etc. That's in relation to healthy and safety issue. You know? But I'm quite happy. The majority of people feedback is not used. This one again. The other one is uh, the, we support those the 500. K, you know, those the one of the strengthened community fund. That's very important because uh, this the COVID the 19 uh, the pandemic lockdown is extraordinary the uh, time period, you know, and also I always emphasize council, we also emphasize council working together with the community as a partnership, then we can achieve our common goal, particularly the, those the social economic and, uh, and culture and the, and the environment, <coughs> those ones, we have to be the, the, the kind of the partnership. The other one is based on all the survey. You know, we dropped from 62% to 50%. So I'm quite happy we increased four and five million dollars for road resilience before the winter time, etc. But also we listen to the people, either from uh, citywide or from the local one. But in the local one, I still would like to, you know, quite highlight regarding the new Hongbi Library and also the customer service and the those uh, Southwest National Center. They particularly emphasizing council we shift three point seven million dollars to fiscal two thousand twenty three. However, you know this long awaited project we want to you know uh, any the delay the, again. The other one is the Hosewe Jiangxin Road extension. This for almost uh, five years, not any progress. And also it's one of the council's uh, shovel ready progress. So we need to monitor this uh, developability as quickly as possible. But generally speaking, I total support uh, the, up to now the list, uh, new device, the, the, uh, the annual plan. And uh, we work together for the implementation of this plan more effectively, efficiently. That's very important. Thank you. James. Thanks. 
Dawn, thank you. Thank you to your staff. Andrew, thank you to you. Uh, a tremendous amount of work has been done and uh, it certainly has been noticed and appreciated by me. And thank you to my colleagues as well. We've also put, uh, all, also all put in a huge amount of time and effort into this to get to, to this point. But I do think that this is a choice between a rate borrow and spend budget or a cut your cloth accordingly budget. And quite frankly, the climate we find ourselves in, I don't think that's actually a choice. I don't think that should be a genuine choice because I think it's a no-brainer. I don't think that the core role of a council is to be providing work and jobs for people. But instead, I think the job of a council is to be making every hard-earned ratepayer dollar count. That is what our community expects of us. Reining in spending is exactly what they should be demanding, and a lot of people have made submissions uh, to that effect. This annual plan still proposes a capital spend for the next, next financial year of $518 million. It's slightly over $400 million in traditional capital spend and about $100 million in a tranche for the multi-use arena and metro sports facility. We're a city of not even 400,000 people. You know, some people have called uh, this austerity, what uh, myself and others have been proposing, but this is over a half a billion dollar capital budget for the next financial year. You know, if that's austerity, I would hate to, to be paying down the debt for an opulent budget. So when justifying the capital spend, you often hear that people say that CapEx is cheaper than OpEx, and, and, and that's true to a point, but it's only because you mortgage up the future uh, with debt plus the CapEx then creates OpEx. So those shiny new facilities, they all need to be operated they all mean to be maintained, and that usually occurs at an ever-increasing cost forever thereafter. So I don't want to specifically signal out projects because we're at a point where we're about to, to sign these off, but I, I do think it's a genuine question to say when you've got four major swimming pool facilities, or uh, Linwood Pool, uh, Hornby Pool, sorry Jimmy, um, uh, Metro Sports Facility, these are all going to be in train, uh, and then the new Brighton Hot Pools, which have just recently opened. After COVID-19, I don't think it would be uh, inappropriate. And in fact, I think it would be prudent for the council to say, do you know what, maybe, maybe one of these projects could, have, could wait a year. Maybe one of these projects, uh, and in the case of Linwood and Hornby, they're 10 minutes down the road from another swimming pool. If you enter the addresses into, into Google Maps, it's 10 minutes down Morehouse Air from Linwood Pool to the Metro Sports Facility. The Horswell Pool is 11 minutes. From the, um, from, from the Hornby site. So I'm not saying these communities don't deserve these facilities. They do. But in light of COVID-19, I think sometimes you need to make a hard call and say, I'm sorry, we may need to wait a year, because that is what is in the best interest of, of the community. And sometimes those hard decisions and those not so popular decisions are the right ones. Fundamentally, I think it's completely inappropriate to be passing on rates rises to our residents at this time. I do not think that it needed to happen, and I do not for one moment except that these rates rises that are now going to be coming were inevitable, because they were not. Mike. Kia ora, and um, thank you to everyone that has taken part in this um, process, including obviously the public who have, have fed in and given us a lot of information for us to, to work on. I actually wrote a debate during the lunch break, which I've changed a lot following uh, listening to everyone. Um, um, so I always going to be heavily critical of a lot of councillors and their push for zero percent, and I changed a lot of that. But I just want to point out to to, <laughs> to Jamie, to Jamie, um, actually the biggest burden I think this city is going to face moving forward will be the stadium, um, especially when we look at the opex of, of that. So if you talk about trying to find stadiums, it's a little bit ironic that all the people pushing for zero percent want the stadium. Um, look, like many households and businesses, COVID has had a significant impact on our finances, but this annual plan is an excellent response and recovery plan that will set us up for the LTP. It does not push the burden of financial crisis onto the next generation. It keeps the rates increases for the average residential home at just over 2%, and it stimulates the economy with significant capital projects. It has been a fine balancing act. We have had to borrow, make savings, and lift rates. Nobody wants to lift rates. But the reality was that a 0% rates increase would have been an anti-family, anti-community and anti-economic recovery budget that would have hurt this city for many years to come, economically, socially and environmentally. And we are listening. We have increased funding to our road resurfacing programme. We are increasing funding to communities of need. We are not reintroducing a toxic weed killer, and we are getting the rates increases down. 
Yes, some households and businesses are finding it hard due to the impact of COVID, and that is why the rate postponement scheme has been continued with a timeline increase so it doesn't have to be paid back until the middle of 2022. This annual plan sets us up for the long-term plan. It is time for this council to reposition, to focus on people and planet. We declared a climate and ecological emergency and set net carbon neutral targets. Time for talk is over. Action is now required. We need to work together on an LTP that keeps rates increases low and affordable and delivers true climate action. Let's think long term, but act now. So this has been an unusual process. Um, in as much as we're adopting an annual plan today after two separate consultations on two separate drafts. The circumstances that we're faced with as a result of COVID-19 and the way it's affected the city and the nation, um, and the circumstances our city is faced with as a result of COVID-19 are equally unusual. Um, but what we've ended up with is a budget which is significantly reworked from the first draft annual plan that we went out for consultation on back in February. And of course, our financial position and the financial position of many of the residents and businesses in the city has changed significantly since then. But there's a need to find the balance. There isn't one lever, one silver bullet that we can use. Our residents wouldn't thank us for reducing levels of service below what's acceptable or for cancelling capital projects that they've been expecting for years, in some cases which they've very recently been consulted on, and in some other cases where construction is already underway. This budget retains the core services that our residents and businesses rely on, but it significantly reduces spending in other areas. It balances the need to provide the levels of service our communities need and that they've told us they want with affordability. It's got a reduced rates increase compared to the first draft of the annual plan, which reflects the downward pressure on rates increases that we are very aware of and a desire not to burden our ratepayers with significant additional costs. So we went out for consultation with a document that had some specific questions in it, and we received some good and well thought out responses to those questions. And the way that we've conducted this meeting today has closed the loop on those matters the excess water, the glyphosate, the increase in community funding. And a number of changes have occurred as a, as a result of submissions and as a result of new information since the draft annual plan was approved. I think it's fair to say that we can demonstrate that we've listened and that we've made changes due to what we've heard. This has resulted in a budget that provides for an overall average rates increase of 3.8% an average residential rates rise of 2.09%, which equates to $1.12 a week for an average priced home. Yes, this is higher than the 3.5% we consulted on, and I was keen earlier today to create an opportunity to bring that rates rise back to 3.5%, and that was the reason I put in front of Council a proposal to do that, if indeed that was the majority view. Finding the balance between the various levers, including rates, borrowing and expenditure, is what preparing and developing a budget like this is all about. By majority, Council decided to go for the higher rate, which is reflected in the numbers that I just mentioned. We've got to where we've got to as a result of the many decisions that we've made throughout the process, as we prepared the draft and as we finalised the budget today. So in the circumstances, I think the fact that we've come up with a budget that continues to deliver services to acceptable levels, which has a capital programme which has been rephased but is able to still be delivered, and which has set rates significantly reduced from the first draft, I think we can call that an achievement. We've got a lot more work to do as we develop the long-term plan, and we've got more hard decisions to make, even harder decisions to make. But this annual plan is another step in that direction. So I'd like to finish by thanking staff, um, not just the finance team, but staff all across this organisation who have worked overtime, evenings and weekends, um, who have worked quickly and methodically and collaboratively to provide information, to answer questions, um, and to work in a way that meant that w we were able to do our job as elected members effectively with good and timely information in front of us. I'd also like to thank Dawn for her leadership of the process, 
I'd like to thank the elected members for the way that um, we have all engaged with the process, given our time and, and really done the work to get to the result that we've got to today. The members of the public as well, we, we should thank, who have engaged by writing submissions um, and the people that took their time to come and speak to us in the chamber. So this has been a collaborative process. And a budget like this is always going to be about compromise, about balancing, and about inevitably in the end, pleasing most of the people most of the time. And what we've seen today is a budget that we've arrived at through those considerations, that collaboration, those compromises, that process, um, and which has been arrived at through the democratic decisions that we very openly made in this meeting today. So I'm happy to be the mover of this budget, and I'll obviously be voting in favour of it today. So I'll put the motion. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Against? No. That's carried. Um, and if we can just note the, those that voted against. Why, why, why don't you do a division? That's quite well, let's do it. Okay, calling right. for a division. Let's run division. Councillor Kuehl. Oh. Yeah, they've changed order. No. <laughs> no, I'm not me, is what I'm saying. <laughs> Councillor McClellan? Ah, uh, yes. Councillor McDonald's? No. Councillor Davidson? Aye. Councillor Galloway? Yes. Councillor Sandrix? No. Councillor Chu? No. Councillor Coker? Aye. Councillor Cotter? Aye. Councillor Chin? Yes. Councillor Templeton? Aye. Councillor Major? Aye. Councillor Turner? Yes. Councillor Johansson? Yes. Councillor Daniels? Aye. Councillor Goff? No. It's 10, 4, and 6 against. 10, 4, 6 against. That's carried. Okay, so now moving to um, the next resolution, um, clause 2.11, um, authorises the Chief Financial Officer to make any amendments. Um, I'm happy to move that. Do I have a seconder? Um, Mike? All those in favour say aye. aye. Against? That's carried. Um, and then clause 2.12. Again, I'm happy to move that clause. Do I have a seconder? Jimmy? Is the authorisation The authorisation to borrow. Yep, 2.12. Um, so moved and seconded. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Against? That's carried. Um, and then the um, clauses 2.13, 2.14, 2.15, 2.16 and 2.17, which have the effect of setting the rate. Again, I'm happy to move those clauses. Melanie, you'll second. 2.15, can we just scroll down, please? Yeah. 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 yeah, so this is setting the rates, but within the parameters that we agreed today. All right, so I'm moving. Um, Melanie, are you happy to second? All right. Mike. But there's just um, one 2.13 card. I just want to record my vote against that, please. Thank so you. I'll put 2.13 separately. You don't need to put it separately. Just, you just record your vote it's against It's just for the Cathedral Heritage Grant. All right. All right. So I will... OK, so I will put 2.13 separately. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Right. Against? No. So... No. Just... All oh, right, OK. All right, so just recording against K then. So that's Sarah, Tim, Mike, Yanni against 2.13 K. All right, so I could have put them all together. So I'll put the balance of the motion now. All those in favour say aye. Against? No. Okay, so the no's are Sam, Catherine, Jamie and Aaron. And Tim. And Tim. No. So that's just the balance. Yeah. All right. So that's um, so that's carried. That's carried. 
Um, so that brings us, and somebody will tell me if I'm wrong, that brings us to the end of the resolutions that need to be um, dealt with. So that therefore brings us to the end of the meeting and we have an annual plan. So there's only one further thing I need to do, which is to turn to Pauline. Well, actually, there's one further thing I want to do before we do that, which is to thank everybody that's been involved, not only in the process, as I did in the debate, but in um, running this meeting as well. Um, I know there's been quite a bit of backwards and forwards and, and work done um, to answer questions and to deal with amendments and so on. Thanks to everybody involved for the support that you've given us in this meeting as well. So thank you very much indeed. And now the only thing for me to do is to turn to Pauline to ask you, Pauline, to close the meeting. Kura. Tukuna tiwara kiriri kite tomata. Koti mata tikam matapuno hiarihi. Ina mahi. Ka auratahi titira kia iki panuku. Kia iki tanga roa. Homie. Huye. Tai kie. Kia Thank you. Um, th thank you, Andrew, for all of that. Like, I w really meant that. You've done a really tremendous job cheering this through what has not always been difficult so thanks